is it a picture of? It's a picture of my son holding his chinchilla. Okay. And then what about um, picture, uh, let's see here, D. Do you need the date? Yeah, what's the date? It's August 9th, 2019. Okay, and what's the picture of? Um, my son petting our horse. Okay. Um, you know, Judge, it's, it's fine. I don't have any problem with you. Either. Okay, so you need your minute? Yeah, the rest of them. The rest of them? Yep. Okay. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Okay, so... Um, okay, you're five, then you need to be talking about E through, I, I, I don't know if it's just pictures, there's some others, this goes to XX, so. Are, and I'm sorry, it should, go to, it should go to YY because I added on just one more. So may I approach Mrs. Crumbly just to give her YY? Okay, do you want me to give this to all of them? Yes, and then okay. we'll just go through each one. Do you agree with all these exhibits or just the Yes, we just need the dates identified, that's all. We'll okay. put those on the record. Well, I'm, I'm not going to hand them to her if I need to look at them first, so. I think they're not objecting to any of them, are they? No, no. Okay. None. Okay, so Mrs. Crumbly, the jury's going to have access to these, so let's just go through them. Um, we are going to identify the dates for the record, though, okay? okay. So going to exhibit, um, let's see here, this is uh, C. What's the date on C? That's June 26, 2019. And what is that? That's uh, my son with his chinchilla. Okay, now I'm going to go down to D. What's the date on that one? Um, that one's August 9th, 2019. Okay, and what's going on in there? Um, that's my son with our horse. Okay, I'm gonna go to E. Um, that's his first day of eighth grade. That's August 26, 2019. Okay, and um, it's fair to say that I just picked out, these are not all your posts, no. right? I don't, I don't wanna keep ejecting, but the form of the question has to be appropriate. Fair to say, this is the okay. correct example. I'm right? asking yeah. a really stupid question, but I'll ask, a new, I'll ask it in a better way. Am I showing every photo from your Facebook page? No. Um, you post more, or how about, do you post more photos than what we see? A lot more. Okay, we're not gonna go through all of them though, no. okay? So this is the first day of what? I'm sorry, last day of? It's the last day of middle school, it's his first day of eighth grade. Okay. I'm gonna go down to F, what's been admitted is F. What's what date is that on? Um, October eleventh, two thousand nineteen. Okay, and what's happening in that photo? Uh, he just got his braces put on. Okay, and let's go down to uh, the next one, which is G. What's the date on G? Um, October thirteenth, two thousand nineteen. What's happening in G? We're apple picking. Okay, so these are just posts of events or things you're doing, correct? Correct. Okay, this one is older, it looks like. What's, or maybe not older, but what's the date on this one? No, this is, I'm sorry, I'm on H. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Uh, November 7th, 2019. Okay, and we see um, your son in this picture on the left, correct? Correct. What's going on in this picture? He's on his, um, it's the ninth grade Washington DC trip with the school. Okay, I'm gonna go down to I. What's the date on I? Uh, May 23rd, 2020. And what's happening in that picture? Um, we're, can you scroll up a little bit? We're somewhere up north. I don't remember where, but we're on probably camping vacation. Okay, he doesn't look thrilled to be in the picture. He doesn't like pictures. Okay. Um, let's go down to J. Uh, what's the date of J? Uh, May 23rd, 2020. Who's in this picture? Uh, it's my son and James. Okay. I'm going to go down to K. Is this, this is a post you made? Yes. What date? Um, August 5th, 2020. What are you showing there? Um, the house when we first bought it and the improvements we made so far. Okay. So this is like a comparison before and after? Yes. All right. Uh, L, what's the date on L? the box without saying who it is his friend okay so where are you guys in this picture uh looks like we're up north okay then we're gonna go to m and we're on september 28 i'm sorry what's the date of this picture um september 28 2020 okay what's this picture that's a picture of my son and our horse okay um i'm going to n uh what date is this october 23rd 2020 Okay, and what is this a picture of? Something Ethan drew. Oh, sorry, my son drew. Okay, and why did you include this? Why did you post about that on Facebook? Because I, he's always a really good drawer. He can, he just draws all the time, and 
we got we got a lot of artists, um, actually tattoo artists in our family, a lot of good drawers. So okay. said it was in his jeans. Okay, that's why you said art is in his jeans. In Correct. the jeans. Correct. Okay. All right. I'm going to O. Uh, what's the date on this one? Um, October 30th, 2020. Okay, and what's going on here? Uh, we are carving pumpkins for Halloween. And there's a big black box. That's his friend. Okay. Um, I am going down to uh, P. What's the date on that one? Uh, November 21st, 2020. Okay, and who who is around for this picture, even if you can't see them in the picture? Um, it's me and my husband and my parents. We're down in um, Florida uh, over Thanksgiving. And what is this that you're doing? We're playing Dark Tower. Okay. Did you guys play games with Ethan often? Yes. What games did you guys play? Well, we played um, Trivia Pursuit. We played What the Meme. We played Yahtzee. Um, we play card games. We played a lot of Uno. Um, uh, the one with all the dice, Spark, Sparkle, I think it's called. Yeah, Sparkle. Um, I don't know. We just we played a lot of games. Okay, I'm gonna go down to Exhibit Q. Uh, what date's that? Um, that's November 24th, 2020. Okay, and we see um, who, who's in the picture? Uh, my husband and my son. Okay, Exhibit S. What's the date? Uh, January 22nd, 2021. Okay, what's going on in R? Um, my son and his friend are playing Jenga. Okay. Um, S, do you know the date on S? Uh, can you scroll up? It's, for some reason, uh, this one is different. Well, it looks like it says February 25th, 2021. And what's going on here? What's happening in February of 21? Um, they're at a bowling match. Okay. Now, um, let's go down to T. What's the date on T? February 26th, 2021. And what's happening here? Um, my stepdaughter came up and visited from Florida, and that's my son with his arm around her. Okay. And, um... In it, with these photos, again, are there, on your real Facebook profile, are there more photos, or is it just what we're seeing? There's more. Okay. So, what's the date on this exhibit, you? Um, May 15th, 2021. Okay, and what's the point of this post? There's a couple pictures. I was showing um, our backyard improvements that we've done since we bought the house. Okay. And then... Um, Let's go to V. What's the date on V? Uh, May 16th, 2021. What are you showing here? Our garden. Okay. Now, um, this is W. What's the date on W? May 29th, 2021. Okay, and who's that? Uh, it's my son and Dexter, his kitten. Okay. Um, Dexter is mentioned in one of the tapes. Is that correct? Yes. What? How is Dexter mentioned? Um... When we were at the substation, I asked my son why, and he said, because I just did take care of Dexter for me. So when he said take care of Dexter, he's, he's meeting his kitten. Um, X, what's the date on X? May 29th, 2021. Okay, and what's going on on this, on this date? Um, my son and Dexter are just hanging out in his bed. Okay, we're going to go to Y. What's the date on this one? I'm sorry, I'm just going too fast. May 31st, 2021. Okay, what's who's in this one? My son and his kitten. Okay, um, Z, what's the date on this one? June 13th, 2021. And where are you guys? We're at Cedar Point. Is this like a family trip? Yes. Did you guys do a lot of family trips? Yes. Okay, a lot of family trips during summer of 2021? Yeah. Okay, um, we're here uh, in exhibit uh, AA. What's that? Yikes. I Bumped it. Um, what's the date on this one? Uh, June 26, 2021. What are you showing here? Uh, my garden. Okay. This is exhibit BB. What date? June 27, 2021. Okay. And what are you doing there? In the pool. Did you guys go in the pool with your son often? Yeah. He can come join, he join us. Okay. And then let's see here. We've got CC. Uh, date? Uh, July 4th, 2021. What's going on here? Um, my son and his friend are playing badminton against my parents. Okay. Is this at your house? Yes. Um, DD, uh, date? July 11th, 2021. Okay, what is this? 
Um, me and my son and his friend were, we found a little spot off the Pollyanne Trail, which runs through Oxford, and there was some weird big boy stuff going on, so we kind of walked around and checked it out. Okay. Um, let's see here. EE. It looks like there's two posts on this date. Um, um, what date is that? That's July 30th, 2021. Okay, and what's happening in these posts? Um, the first one I posted, uh, my son and his friend were both passed out from a lot of hiking we did that day. Okay, what about the next photo from... Those are pictures of the campground that we were at. Okay, and so you took, is it fair to say you had the front end vacation? Yeah, most of the time. Okay. Um, July 31st, I'm sorry, what's the date on this one? I'm on FF. Um, July 31st, 2021. Okay, what is this? Uh, we went to the Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes. Okay, and where it says like plus 29, what does that mean? There's 29 more photos that go along with that. Okay, we're not going to show them all though. Okay. All right, we're going to GG. What's going on here? Uh, what's the date? Uh, August 21st, 2021. What are you guys doing August 21st, 2021? Uh, my son and his friend were putting up a tent in our backyard and doing backyard camping. Okay. What's the next one? Uh, you posted this on what date? I posted on August 21st, 2021. Okay, and what's the point of this post? Um, it was a memory from three years ago of my son, his friend, uh, with our horse, and I was pointing out to... Um, to my fr to my son's friend's mom that they were so small three years ago. Okay. Uh, what about this one? What's the date on, let's see here, I.I.? I? Um, August 25th, 2021. Okay, what's this? That's his first day of school. Okay, what grade? Uh, tenth grade. And let's go to J.J. What's this date? Um, August 29th, 2021. Okay, what's going on in this picture? Um... Me and, me and my son were taking a picture for his um, old football coach. Um, the son, I tagged him in it. Um, it was the only picture he would take with me so he could say hi to his coach rope. All right. What about um, date on this one, which is marked as KK? Um, September 6, 2021. And what's going on there? Um, my son's leash training his kitten. Do cats ever walk on a leash? It wasn't successful. Okay. Uh, next picture, LL. What's the date? Um, September 18th, 2021. Okay, and what are you doing here? Uh, we rented a house, a houseboat for the weekend, and my husband and I are walking around the outside on the dock and we're sneaking pictures of the boys inside the houseboat, houseboat playing card games. Why were you sneaking pictures of them? Because they wouldn't let us take any pictures of them. Okay, typical teenagers. All right, MM. Um, what's that date? September 18th, 2021. Okay, and what were the photos here? It was, I know it was the houseboat weekend. We went to um, Mackinac City, so I think it was something in Mackinac City. Okay, and then the blacked out box, is that the friend? I think it's the, fr I think it's the friend's parents. The friend's, okay. Oh, no, the friend, but I, never mind, I saw, I, never mind. Okay, NN, what's the date on this one? Um, September 21st, 2021. Okay, and what's this? Uh, my son and Dexter sleeping. And now we are at September 20... I'm sorry, what's the date on this one? I'm on OO. Um, September 26, 2021. Okay. What does that show? Um, we were breaking up our, our side steps to the deck and planning a flower bed in the front of the, in the, front of the house. Okay. So we're in fall of 21, is that fair? Yes. Okay, what's the date on this picture? I'm on PP. October 3rd, 2021. Okay, what's this picture? What are these pictures about? Um, we decorated our house for, for the Halloween. Okay, and then let's go here to QQ. Date? October 9th, 2021. And what's shown in this picture? Our, our front porch that we redid. Okay, called it a makeover? It was. All right, and then let's go here to RR. Uh, what date is that? October 15th, 2021. Okay, and what are you doing there? Uh, I was just showing the like what we've got so far with the paint job, um, remodeling the living room and dining room, basically. Okay, um, next one is uh, SS. What's the date on this one? October 25th, 2021. Okay, what is this? 
This was a text I sent to my son. Um, him and my husband were going somewhere, I don't remember. But I was just checking in. I said, you guys are okay? And my son made the comment, no, we're in the back of a white van headed to Alabama. Because he's very sarcastic, and I found it funny, and I posted it. Okay. Um, was he did, he, did was he sarcastic yeah. more? I'm sorry. Go go ahead, go ahead. Explain the sarcasm. I mean, that's, a, that's an example of it right there. Okay. Um, yeah, he, he was always sarcastic, always messing around with us. Okay, when you say messing around with you, we're gonna we're gonna get that to that when we talk about some other posts. Is that fair? Okay. Okay. So let's go down to this photograph. TT. What is this? What date? That's October 29th, 2021. <laughs> okay. And um, what are you doing? That's where we're on the virtual reality playing Beat Saber. Okay. And then this this one you you. Okay, what's the date on this one? November 26th or 25th, <laughs> 2021. Okay, and what's going on here? Uh, Thanksgiving. Okay, Thanksgiving, <coughs> is this Thanksgiving Day? Yes. So this would have been Thursday? Correct. Okay. We're going to talk more about the next couple of days more slowly, but I'm going to go through the pictures first, okay? And then I'm going to take them off the screen so we can talk a little more. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so what's the po what is this post? What's the date on this one, VV? Um, November 25th, 2021. And what is this picture? What are these pictures showing? Um, uh, our family, my aunt and uncle, my cousin and her husband, and then me, James, and my son. And okay. it shows us um, playing dice. Okay. Or left, right, center. Is this on Thanksgiving? Yes. All right. And then... Um, on WW, what day is this on? Uh, that's November 26, 2021. Okay, and what were you guys doing on this day, um, November 26, 2021, which is a day we're going to talk about in more detail? Uh, we we're cutting a Christmas tree down. Okay, and then ultimately we have XX. What date is this? November 27, 2021. Okay, so this would have been uh, Saturday. Yes. And what's going on in this picture? Uh, we got our Christmas decorations and everything out. Okay. Then we have um, YY. What day is this from? November 26, 2021. Okay. And what's happening in this picture? Um, my son and my husband are laughing at me because I dragged them around the whole tree farm to pick the tree. So they were finally happy it was over. Okay. So that's YY, right? Right. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna close this for just a minute, and um, and just make sure that exhibits B through YY were admitted. They're admitted. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then the defense is only gonna have one other exhibit, but we'll get to that one. Okay. Okay. So, Mrs. Crumbly, I want to go back and talk to you. We were. We went through a lot of Facebook pages, obviously, or pictures. Um, on Thanksgiving, who was at your house? It was my aunt and uncle, my cousin, and her husband. And what did you guys do, if anything, that night? Well, they were they were there probably until about 7 or 8 o'clock, so we played left, right, center. Um, the normal family family stuff. Did did everything did anything seem off or strange with your son? No. Was he spending time with family members or was he in his room? What was he doing? He was back and forth. He would come out and play games with us or when it got to adult talk, he would go in his room and play his video games. Now we definitely saw a lot of his friend in the photographs. Were there other times where he would not have his friend with him? Yeah, there were times. Okay, um, were there, was he happy? Was he okay without his friend? Was he, how was he? Yeah, I mean, most of the times it was just the three of us. Um, it was usually out of state travel. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, so on the day after Thanksgiving, do you, what did you do that day? Um, I went shopping, I go shopping every every year, day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday shopping. I wake up about four o'clock and I go shopping. Okay, so where did you go that day, if you remember? Um, I usually go to Meyer, and then from there, I'll head up to Marshall's and Lapeer. Um, and then sometimes I will hit the, um, not Home Depot, the other home improvement store, Menards. I would hit Menards. 
And on that date, um, when you went, it was the 26th, correct? Yes, correct. Um, do you know, when you left your house, did you know what James and uh, Ethan, your son, were going to be doing that day? Uh, no, they were sleeping when I left. Okay, when you got home, were they home or were they at, where were they? They weren't home. Did they ever come home? Yeah, I um, I texted my husband and asked where you were at, and um, I believe he called me and told me that him and Ethan were at the Acme um, uh, firearm store looking at guns. Okay. And then they came home from there. Okay, did they purchase the gun that day? They did. Okay, the prosecution brought in exhibits showing the receipts, all of that. You weren't with them when they bought the gun, correct? No, I was not. Okay. You did post on Facebook a photo of the gun. We okay. saw the the post, correct? Correct. And in the post that's been admitted already, you described it as your son's cr uh, Christmas gift. Um, can you explain who wanted the gun? How, what, what, what was, what does it mean? Um, they had rented a nine millimeter at the shooting range before, so they knew it was the type of gun, or the size gun, I guess what it is, that, um, they wanted to get, and my son and my husband did a lot of texting back and forth. My son did a lot of research on it, and they're comparing different ones that they wanted to buy. Um, that went that went on for a couple of months. Um, my husband just kind of kept blowing it off, like not you know not right now, not right now. And then I guess when I was out shopping, they said, "Well, let's go try on Black Friday, see if we can get one on sale, or if there's any deals going on." Okay, so they ultimately did get one. Right. Um, now. Did you object? Did you say, I don't want that gun in the house? Anything like that? No, I was more angry that they cut into our Christmas tree time. Usually cut my Christmas tree down right after I get back from shopping, but I had to wait for them. So I was, I was irritated at that. When they came home, did they show you the, the gun? Yes. Okay, and what did you guys do? Um, they, they just showed me it was on the kitchen counter, and then um, my husband put it up, and we went to the Christmas tree farm. What do you mean by put it up? He put it back in the case with the cable lock and back in the bedroom. Okay, let's talk about just guns overall. Um, this jury needs to understand some some details, okay? If I ask a question you don't know what I'm talking about, let me know, because okay. are guns your thing? Not really, no. Okay, but do you have awareness about guns within your home? I do. Okay, who is responsible for storing the gun? My husband is. Okay, explain why you say he's responsible for that role. Um, I just didn't feel comfortable being in charge of that. It was more his thing, so I let him handle that. I didn't feel comfortable putting the lock thing on it. Um, I just, I just rather, just rather not let him do it. And I think in one of the messages that was admitted with Brian, you called it a string lock. Yeah. Okay. Do you understand now it's a cable lock? I do. Okay. So, were there ever any times where you would take the cable lock off or put it on? No. Now, the, there were, prior to buying that gun, did you, did James own any other guns? He did. How many? Two. And by two, the jury has seen the uh, Derringer and the Caltech. Were those the other two? Correct. Okay, so those are the other two guns. How were those stored? Uh, they were stored in a safe. Okay, and was that different than the 9 millimeter? It was. Okay, explain to the jury the difference. Um, we, we had a gun safe, so when they bought the, the two other guns, they transported the two other guns into the gun safe. Um, and then everything else, well, I don't know. The, everything went, like the cable lock and the other case went somewhere. Um, the 9 millimeter was in a case, but it was locked in the, it was in the case locked with a cable lock. Okay, and how... The cable lock that was on the 9 millimeter. what did you have to use to get the cable lock open? A key. Okay, did you keep, did you have possession of the key? No. Okay, where was the key? It was, I collected German beer steins, so it was in one of the beer steins. Where are those located? Uh, throughout the house. We have them on top of the, there's a, a ledge over the refrigerator in our kitchen, um, so they go from wall to wall. Then we had corner shelves in our house that had them. Um, we had a lot. Okay. Did did you know which particular beer stein the cable lock key was in? No. Do you know if your son knew which beer stein it was in? Uh, no. 
What about ammunition for the nine millimeter? Was there any bought on the 26th when the weapon was purchased? No. Okay, so that day um, we saw obviously your Facebook post. Um, you describe it as your son's gift. Did he have free access to that gun? No, it, it was for him to use at the shooting range only. Was he allowed to take it out? Not without my husband around. Did he know where it was kept? My husband hid it usually in our bedroom in different spots. Okay. What was the intention of hiding it? That's just what you're supposed to do. Okay. And when it was hidden, did was it locked in any way? It had the, the cable lock on it. Okay. And you again testified about the key being in a beer stein? Correct. Would the beer stein be right by the cable lock? Or? No. Okay, so where would the beer stein be? It would probably be in one of the ones in the kitchen. Okay, so the key's out there, um, and then you've got the... Did you know where the gun was hidden in your room on um, November 26th when you put it away? No. Okay, on November 27th, um, we saw the whole video of you going to the shooting range with Ethan, correct? correct. Or with your son, correct? Correct. Okay, on that day, we see it in the video that you carry the gun case into the gun range, right? Correct. Okay, how did the gun get into the get to the gun range? Um, it, well, my husband had got it ready for me and put it in the back of my car. And what I does that mean, got it ready for Took you? the cable lock off, put, um, I guess I put the, the magazine things in the case and put it in the back of my car and then I drove um, with my son to the shooting range with the gun in the back of my car. That's how I got there. Okay. Did you um, did you see him or watch him take the cable lock off that day? No. Why not? I think I was just doing something else. I didn't pay attention. Okay. So when you got to the gun range, we saw in the video you carry it in, carry it to the counter. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, the jury's seen all this, five bullets, and then you guys go shooting, correct? Correct. Okay, we obviously see you and your son. That shows the whole experience while you're there. Correct. Okay, um, so after, while you're there, um, how interested were you in in shooting that weapon? Um, I, I shot it a couple times. I don't know, shooting's kind of boring. I'm more like skeet shooting, where actually something's going on. So I shot it a couple of times and he did the rest. Okay, and um, did you end up posting something about it being a mother Sunday? I did. How did you feel about that day? I felt, I mean, it was, it was a fun day. He asked me if I wanted to go to the shooting range with him and he's never asked me, just me, to go before. My husband was um, doing DoorDash and I, I felt good about it. How many times had you been to the shooting range before that day? Once. And when you went the one other time, uh, who else was present? Uh, my husband. So this was the first day you're the only adult going? Correct. Okay, so after, we see obviously in the video you carry the gun in the case out. It did it have the cable lock on at that point? No. Okay, so what did you do from there? Um, this is when we're leaving? Yeah. Um, I put the gun in the back of my vehicle and drove. Where, explain where in the back of your oh, vehicle. So I, in the back of the SUV, it has a little uh, thing that opens up where the spare tire is. I put it under there. Okay. And then where did you go? I uh, went home. And did you take the gun in the house? No. I took the bullets in the house and hit them, and my husband uh, took the gun in the house when he got home from work. Okay, so was there a period of time that the gun was not in the home, but in your car? Yeah, probably for a couple hours. Okay, why is that? I just, I just don't feel comfortable with it. I don't, I don't, that's his thing. Okay, so on that Saturday, um, it was left in the vehicle, and your vehicle was locked. Correct. Do you know if the gun was brought into the house and put away? Yes. Okay, how do you know that? Uh, my husband told me. Okay. Yep. Did you... Did you um, watch him do anything in terms of putting it away, or if you were, if you didn't, just let me know. No, I didn't. Okay. The next day is Sunday, correct? Correct. And on that day, um, was there any? Do you recall any issues with the weapon? Any issues with the gun? No. Okay. Um, now, when. The next day is Monday, is that right? Correct. Okay, what did you do on Monday? I went to work. Okay, 
And on Monday, we heard the voicemail you got. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Describe for the jury overall what happened or what you were dealing with that day. Um, I received the voicemail on my phone while I was at work. It was Pam Fine, um, the school one of the school counselors, uh, calling to let me know that my son was looking at bullets in class. Um, she let us know, let me know that um, they had a meeting with my son and that he. So what he was doing was wrong, admitted responsibility. Um, they gave him an example about teachers. Even they, they, they brew beer at home. She'd be looking at it up in school. And it was there. It was, it was kind of upbeat. And then she ended up with, um, you know, he understood. He went back to class. Just wanted to let you know. If you have any questions, please give us a call. Have a good holiday. Okay. And on that date, did you call Miss Fine back? No, I did not. What was your reaction to getting that message? Um, I mean, it was pretty, pretty black and white. I mean... She said what happened. They seemed like they solved the problem, and I didn't have any questions. Okay. So on that date, um, did you end up saying anything to James about it? I believe I did. Did you say anything to your son about it? I did. What did you... And I think we saw text messages. You said, don't get, next time, don't get caught. Yeah, I said seriously looking up um, bullets in school, and then he went through a long couple of texts about teachers looking at his stuff, and... He was worried about who was going to get in trouble, and then I said, um, next time, don't get caught. What did you mean by that? Um, so there's a, an ongoing thing in our house. I would, my, someone always asked me the trouble I'd get in high school because I was a little bit of a troublemaker because I always got caught. Like, all my friends could be doing the same thing, and I'd be the one to get caught. So I was kind of referencing to that. Okay. So you said that, um, and did you feel you had to discipline him or do anything beyond talked to him about it? No, we talked. I li listened to the voicemail, and that was that. Okay. Now, on, um, I'm going to go back for a couple minutes to talk to you about some exhibits the prosecution introduced from earlier in the year, okay? okay. So I'm going to start with um, what's been admitted as exhibits 155 through 160, okay? I'm gonna pop them up on the screen and we're gonna just talk about each one briefly. So I'm gonna go to 155. Okay, plug my... I'm sorry, it's not good to plug it in. Okay, so... I'm going to start with 155, okay? This was already admitted, so we're not going to belabor this, okay? Oh, no, she doesn't have a picture of Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's not necessarily about this one. It's like, here. Oh. Okay. There, there it is. Okay. So we've already talked about this with other witnesses, so I'm going to go a little bit faster. If you need me to slow down, let me know. Okay. Okay? This is um, Ms. DeRiker's email with her and Sean Hopkins. She's telling him... Um, when you get a chance, can you call uh, your son down to the down and see how he's doing? He's failing my class, tries to sleep all the time in class. Sean responds, I'll catch him by the end of the day. Thanks, just a little worried. And um, and that's that. You heard testimony about that, correct? Correct. Were you ever aware there was a time where your son was failing a class and trying to sleep all, all in capital letters, all the time in class? I can't remember what class the record was, um, so I'd probably be aware if he was failing that class from power school, but I was not aware that he was sleeping all the time. So did anyone from the school let you know in May of 2021, hey, he's sleeping in class and failing? No. Okay. That was Exhibit 155. Um, and would that show up on power schools, that, the emails between that? No. Okay. Exhibit 166. This is from September 8th, 2021. Um, it starts off with an email from Miss McConnell to Sean Hopkins. It says, can you please touch base with Ethan Crumbly? In his autobiography poem, he said he feels terrible and that his family is a mistake. Unusual responses for sure. He writes back, thanks for the heads up. I'm in senior meetings throughout the day. I'll try to catch up with him. Were you aware this was ever a discussion or an issue? No. Were you aware that Mr. Hopkins ever talked to or tried to talk to your son? No. Did anyone ever call you to make you aware of any of this? No. If you heard this, um, how, would you, how would you react or what would your reaction be? Um, 
I'd be definitely concerned why he feels like his family's a mistake and he feels terrible. So that would be that would be a concern to me. Okay. So you this is something you were unaware of. Correct. And in fact, when did you find out these emails existed? Uh, when we started getting discovery. Okay, so in this case. Correct. All right, so I want to go to one, uh, 157. This is on November 10th of 2021. Um, this is uh, Miss McConnell sends Sean a message. Ethan Crumbly is having a rough time right now. We may need to speak with you. Um, Sean writes back, I'm sorry I was in a meeting through the end of the day. I'll catch up with him. Um, were you ever made aware that there was some issue on November 10th where your son was having a rough time? No. Did anyone from the school ever let you know? No. Did you ever see anything like this um, prior to us getting materials in this case? No. If you heard um, your son was having a rough time, what would you do to follow up? I would talk to my son, find out what's going on. Okay. And I am going to minimize these for one second. I want to go back to um, some other dates that were discussed and exhibits were admitted. And I'm going to go back to March 20th. I'm sorry. Let's start. I'm going to order. So March 16th of 2021, um, the prosecution has admitted exhibits 85, 86, 85 through 94, and um, let's see here, 85 shows you guys are making plans, and you say, I'm going to get drunk and ride my horse. Can you explain to the jury what you meant by that? And I'll get it up on the screen. Um, I was going to have some drinks and ride my horse. It was St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm sorry, that's on the, that's on the 17th, Correct. right? Yeah. Okay, the 16th, though. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Okay, so explain that again. So let me get it up on the screen, because I'm messing up. Okay, 85. Okay, so 85, um, I'm sorry, you're right. So on page 85, 432 is the page number. You write, I'm going to get drunk and ride my horse. What was your plan that night? Um, I was gonna have a couple of drinks and go for a trail ride with my horse. Okay, did you do that that night? Uh, yes. And on um, People's Proposed Exhibit uh, 86, or their admitted exhibit, this was the text thread between you and your son. Um, Let's see here. This is a text where the prosecution uh, admitted to show that your son texted you, okay, the house is now haunted. What time was that text at? Um, it says 6.03. Okay. I don't know if it says minus four. I don't know what that means. Okay. And then um, the next text, some weird shit just happens and now I'm scared. Next one, I got some videos and a picture of the demon is throwing bowls. I'm not joking, it fucked up the kitchen. I'm just gonna be an outsider for a while. Can you at least text back? Okay, do you recall this day on March 17th, 2021? <clears throat> it didn't stick out to me until this whole... No, I don't, I, I don't recall it exactly. I just remember it ever since we got discovery on this case. Okay, so on um, March 17th, um, there was a point um, when you, did you ever see these texts? I probably didn't. Not that time. Do you recall seeing these texts at any point prior to this case? I'm sure I did, but they didn't, they weren't. No, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure I saw them, but they just didn't stick out to me until this case. Why didn't they stick out to you? Because it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was anything serious. It was um, Ethan just messing around. You gotta explain to the jury how did Ethan mess around? Um, so he's been convinced our house has been haunted since 2015. So it was built in 1920. Um, around that time frame, him and his friend would go down to the basement and play a Ouija board. So. 
they thought we had a house ghost. Um, so it was around that time when he would mess with us that things were going on in the house. Uh, silverware was flying across the room. Um, doors were slamming. He actually took a video of the door and showed me when I got home. And you can clearly see where he's standing back with his phone, looking at the door that's open. You can see him walk up the door, and you can kind of see him slam it of him trying to say, see, our house is haunted. So it was that kind of stuff that he, he did. Okay, and did that continue on into 2021 when you'd get messages like this? Um, only a couple of times, but I think it just kind of, he just got over it. Like it wasn't, he got was <laughs> bored with messing around with the, with the, with the ghost. So. Did you mess around with him? Yes. Okay, what did you do to him? Um, when they were downstairs in the basement playing Ouija board one night, I went and flipped the circuit breaker off in the house, and he thought it was the ghost they conjured up on the Ouija board. Did James ever mess around with you or with Ethan? Um, yeah, a little bit. Give us an example of what he did. Um, he said a lamp fell off a ledge in the basement, and so he named the ghost Victoria, so he was convinced there was another house, house ghost. So just kind of like an ongoing, like, our house ghost, we called it. My son named it Boris Johnson. My husband named it Victoria. It was just, just kind of, it was just like a little phase. Was there ever a time where James pretended he got electrocuted? Yes. What did he do? Um, we were remodeling our living room, and he was taking the old ceiling fan down and having to figure out what wires go where to the new ceiling fan. And as he was reaching up, he pretended to get electrocuted, and he fell on the ground and was shaking. And I ran up, and I kicked him. I don't know why I kicked him, but I did. And... Then he stopped, and I realized he was joking, and my son had the phone recording the whole time. So this kind of stuff between you, your son, and your husband was like typical joking around kind of stuff. It was. Okay, so did you, when you look back at these texts now, and you see that there's a demon throwing bowls and things like that, now looking back, do you think, oh my gosh, he had mental issues? No. What do you think was going on? Just what I said that it was just him messing around. It only he only, he only did it when we weren't at home, and it was for a short period of time, and then like, he got bored. Okay. So on that date, the prosecution admitted all kinds of stuff to show you were with your horrors, mm -hmm. and James was with your horrors, correct? Correct. And you guys were with your horrors, correct? How long would you have been out there? Uh, what was a typical trip to the barn? Um. Usually about three hours. It takes about a half hour to get the horses tacked up and ready. Um, we usually rode for about an hour and then anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes to cool them down. And um, with respect to the horses, did you and James go out there? Did you go every day? No. How did that work? Who went? How did you guys pick? Um, whoever felt like going or had the most availability. Sometimes I'd work late, you know, past six o'clock um, at night. I couldn't go. Um, there's nights that my son had to go to bowling um, that had taken. We just, it, how, whatever happened that day, we just say, I'm going or you're going or it just was a day by day thing. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead. This has been admitted as Exhibit 84. This goes to March 8th and 9th. Okay, do you remember talking about those dates? I think so, yeah. Okay, now on those dates, the prosecution admitted Exhibit 84, which is up on the screen. These are texts between um, James and you, and it looks like you're saying you're going to have to skip the barn tonight. Do you recall that? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. And then um, you ask, is Ethan going to bowling? Correct. Um, James says, IDK, what does that mean? I don't know. All right. And you ask him about that. Okay, and I want you to describe, what are you doing in these text messages up on the screen here, these four in a row? Can you go back to the green one? Yeah. Okay. Um, here, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I got it now. I was just texting him, asking him if he was home from school yet. Okay. And if he had his phone on him. So you're texting... I, th <laughs> I think, looking at this, we must have got into an argument about his grades and took his phone away the night before, which is why I was asking if he had his phone on him. Is it common for you to text repeatedly about someone? Are you home? Where yeah. are you? Yes. Okay. So in your messages, is that, is it fair to say you're, we're going to see that a lot from you? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Your husband wrote back, he does not get home till 3.16. Did you know what time Ethan got home every day? I knew it was after three, like shortly after. I wasn't sure to the minute. Okay, well then you wrote, I want, I told you to pick him up because he's upset and I don't want him to do anything stupid, God damn it. What did you mean by that? Um, I don't know, just if he, I wanted him, if he walked home, I was worried if like he was upset, he would just walk to Little Caesars or Frosty Boy and not let us know and then I'd worry or he'd take the, he'd take the route through, there's like, um, some kind of woodsy area to get the trail to our house and there's some homeless people that live back in there. It was just more or less, I was just worried about him just not wanting to come home because we got, we got an argument the night before. So when you say, I, I don't want him to do anything stupid, were you worried he'd hurt himself or anything like that? No. And your James responds, dude, chill, he is fine, and I am trying to fucking work. Your next question, does he have his phone? Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, and then he says he won't answer while he's walking. The exhibit speaks for itself. And then you start up with, I'm seriously freaking out. Is he home yet? And then it looks like a blank message. Yeah. Why are you freaking out so much? Because he didn't tell me he was home. So, and I think he must have, I don't know, me with work, I couldn't get a hold of him. So it was like, why can't I get a hold of you? Why, why can't I get a hold of anybody? Okay. Did this concern you um, ultimately that something happened that day or did this get resolved? I think he just got home and that was it. Okay. Now, the next day, um, which would have been the 9th, you and James, we can agree, went to the barn together that day, correct? Correct. They, the prosecution provided a picture, GPS um, exhibits, uh, phone data exhibits, correct? Correct. All right. On that day, we agree you guys are at the barn together. Correct. Okay. I'm going to go to the prosecutor's exhibit 82 that was uh, admitted, okay? And you text, you send him a message to Ethan that says, where are you? Or Ethan sends you a message that says, I'm sorry. You send a message to Ethan saying, where are you? At 317 and 32 seconds, UTC minus five, correct? Correct. All right. So then Ethan sends you all these texts. Can you get home now? I think that someone's in the house. Someone walked into the bathroom and flushed the toilet, left the light on. I thought it was you, but I came out, no one was home. There is no one in the house though. Dude, my door just slammed. Maybe it's just my paranoia. But when are you going to get home? Okay, what what was going on that day? Um, so if you go back to you go back to the beginning of the thread. Okay. Is this the beginning? So you can see um, the time on there. That was the time I'd be driving home from the barn. And when I got home, he was asking me why I didn't answer the text. And he said the, how, the weird stuff was going on in the house again. And that was that. Okay. When you walked in, do you recall discussing these messages with him? Um, it was mainly, I've been trying to text you. Why don't you answer? And I told he him, said that or you said that? He said that. Okay. And I, and I told him I was driving home. I wasn't looking at my phone. So what's, why weren't you looking at your phone or what's going on with your, did you have a signal? Do you not have a signal? What's happening? I, I could have had a signal. I don't know. I probably just had my phone in the front seat of the passenger side and didn't look at it. Okay. Um, when you're out at the barn, do you get every text that people send you? No. What's your signal like out there? Um, I have Metro PCS, so it's not as good as somebody had AT&T and Verizon, but there's very limited spots. Um, at any barn I've been at where there's any type of signal, usually you have to find the one, the one spot you'll see everybody standing at talking on the phone, but it's not, it's not all over the barn. What about on the roads to the barn? Um, so that barn we were at, it was between Oxford and um, uh, Groveland area. So all those roads, once I pass the market, it's all, it's, there's no signal. Unless I, until I got up to a fire station, then I have a signal. And then once I pass the fire station, I wouldn't have a signal. Then I hit a grocery store, I'd have a signal. Once I got past the grocery store, all the way to the barn, I had no signal. Looking back on these texts now from March 9th, okay, seeing him say, there's someone in the house, I think. Someone walked in the bathroom and flushed the toilet, left the light on. Do you think he was having mental issues that day? No. How, what do you think, What what is your conclusion about these messages at this time? He was just messing with us. Okay. Is this the kind of messing you previously talked about? Yes. 
All right, I want to go to March 20th. Um, this is People's Exhibits uh, 96 through 100. Um, they established on this date you're out at the barn. This is you, yes? Yes. Okay, and um, another picture of you. Yep. And we've got data showing that you were out there, correct? correct. And there's a text message exchange that was admitted as People's 96. I'm gonna put that up on the screen for you, okay? Okay. So in People's 96, this is between you and your son, correct? Correct. Um, he says, can you at least text back? You're asking, where's your dad? Text me when you're done, done yet? And he starts up with, I just, I finished picking up the room. I cleaned until the clothes started flying off the shelf. This stuff only happens when I'm home alone. I pick the clothes back up though. That's at, um, it looks like 2.34, uh, and we may be off by an hour or so because it's that UTC, this one's minus four. Um, your next text is jumping in shower, text your dad if I don't respond, and your text, no matter what the time zone is, is six hours later. Well, Do you recall getting these texts? It's two days. Messages? It's two days and six hours later. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Two days and six hours. So, do you recall though getting these couple on the twentieth about I finished picking up the room, I cleaned until clothes started falling off the shelf? Do you recall that? Only when we got discovery. Okay. Now, looking back on these days, are you thinking, oh my God, there were he thought things were happening that were crazy? No. Did you think any, do you think anything of it now? No. What do you think is happening in those, in those messages? I just think he was messing with us. Okay, so those are three times where um, you guys are at the ranch and he's messing with you. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. Um, and at that time, um, that was months and months before November. That's, it was in March, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, so beyond March, um, did was there other times where he was saying these goofy texts and messing around? No, I don't think so. Okay. So there's there's two more um, dates I need to ask you about. I'm going to go to April 4th, um, which was a Sunday, and that is going to be um, exhibit that was admitted 101, okay? So exhibit 101 are text messages. And these are between, who are these between? Those were uh, between my son and his friend. Okay, now prior to this case, did you ever see any of these messages? I did not. Were you aware any of them existed? I was not. Okay, so this is from April, April 4th, and your son's saying, he's the one tech, sending messages that say, I hear people talking to me and someone in the distance. I actually asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he gave me some pills and told me to suck it up. Like, it's at the point I'm asking to go to the doctor. Was there ever a time where he asked to go to the doctor around this time? I don't think so, no. Then he says, my mom laughed when I told her. Was there ever a time where he's asking for help and you're laughing? No. He writes to his friend, and this is just later that night, but I'm having bad insomnia and paranoia, and I need help. I was thinking of calling 911 so I could go to the hospital, but then my parents would be really pissed. Okay, so this is all one long conversation. Is that right? Correct. He says, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. But this time I'm going to tell them about the voices. This text message or instant message thread, did you ever, were you even aware of this? No. Do you remember any time where he came and talked to you and said anything about hearing voices? No. Do you recall there ever being a time where he asked you for go to go to a doctor or to get help and you said no? No. Or laughed at him? No. So when you see these texts with his friend, um, do you have any idea, and if you don't, that's fine, do you have any idea what he's doing with his friend? I, I don't have any idea. 
Okay. Do you know if him and his friend messed around with each other like you and your husband do Speculation with him? Judge. If, I'm sorry. If she'd have to have personal knowledge. Um, you were, when you were testifying earlier, you mentioned that your son and his friend would play within a Ouija board. Is that right? Right. Is, when did that happen or in relation to um, 2021? Um, I know he got the Ouija board for Christmas of 2020. Um, so for a few months after that, they were really into playing it, and then they got bored with it. And it's probably sitting on our shelf getting dust. Okay. Um, on April 29th, I'm going to turn your attention to that day. Um, do you recall texting his friend's mother? And I'm going to put up Exhibit 104 on the screen. Okay, do these texts look familiar to you? They do. Okay, who are these between? These are between uh, me and his friend's mom. Okay, and you say, you start off with Ethan is, I'm sorry, the, my son isn't bullying tonight. I just want to let you know, not sure if he needs a partner. Why are you texting that? Um, I don't know why he wasn't bullying tonight, off the top of my head, um, but, I, but they had partners on certain nights of the week, and so... Him and his friend were always partners, so I was letting her know that he wasn't going to be there. Okay, and this is on one date, April 29th. Did you talk to her on other dates, or is this, like, the only time you talked to her? We, we've talked back and forth quite a bit. Okay. Now, on this date, you say he's been acting kind of depressed. I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure if there's something bothering him at school, but he doesn't really feel good. I can't get anything out of him. Um, she... Friend's mom mentions he stayed home from school today, too. The only time they're happy is when they're together. Um, talking about grades, you mentioned this is all new to me. I'm not used to my son being moody. He's usually pretty happy, and we'll talk about anything. I do know he's been stressed about school and his grades. Um, we called the school, but she wasn't in social do it tomorrow. I think his grades have a lot to do with it. I just got to a point where he's got so far behind and we were out of town. He's having difficulties making it up. Where were you guys out of town? Um, in Florida. My, my uh, mother-in-law had passed away, so we were gone for a couple of weeks in the middle of April taking care of funeral arrangements and everything. And at this time, when you describe your son as being moody or depressed, did you think it was anything that warranted getting medical attention? No, he was just being quieter. He's, he's a quiet kid. He was just being quieter than normal. Um, and I'd ask him if everything was okay. He'd say fine. But I just tell he was a little sad. And I thought maybe um, him and his, I didn't see his friend in a, in a couple of weeks. And I don't know if maybe they got into a fight and they weren't talking. Um, so I was asking her if there was anything going on with his, his friend, which might have caused my son to be quieter than normal. But I think he was just really stressed out because those two weeks that we were in Florida, he got pretty far behind on his grades. Okay, so then it goes on and you end up saying, yeah, me too, I'm glad they're getting along. And it wasn't an issue with those two as to why he was being depressed. The online school is horrible. I've given up two. I told him just to do his best. Don't worry about it. Next year's a new year. And then maybe if his friend is feeling better, he wants to come over to work, and then you're talking, talking, talking about shooting up a gun range in the backyard, correct? Yeah, targets. Okay, so did this issue of him feeling depressed or acting moody, this one, this one period of time, did that go on or did that discontinue? It discontinued. I mean, it was like, it was a little phase, um, and he seemed to be fine. Him and his friends started coming over more. I think it was more or less his friend wasn't coming over as much, and he just seemed quieter than normal. And you guys were out of town. You had just been out of town for right. a Yeah, and he just lost his grandmother, so that was that was sad, too. Okay. All right, and then there was one other conversation that you had with, um, with his friend's mother that the prosecution introduced as Exhibit 105. I'm going to put that up, okay? So this is actually from... Uh, let's see here. Starts off on um, I'm going to go to Halloween. So 1031 of 21. You say to her, James filled me in on his friend last night. I'm so sorry you guys are having to make such a hard decision. Please let me know if you need anything. What was that about? Um, 
we had found out the day before thing, or Halloween um, that his son, or their, my, son's friend, my son's friend, went to Wisconsin to an OCD treatment school. Um, we, didn't, we didn't know. We had Halloween plans, um, and we were texting with his parents, his friend's parents, about is his friend still coming over the car of pumpkins on Halloween because they do it every year, and then um, they go out and trick-or-treat. And we didn't hear from him, and all of a sudden we got a, my, my husband found out through his friend's dad that they drove to Wisconsin, and, and he's at OCD treatment center for at least 90 days. So it hit us really hard because we didn't really expect it coming. Um, he didn't expect it coming. It was just, it was, it was hard. Did you do anything different as a parent when his friend was um, taken away, essentially, to the hospital or the other school? I don't understand. Um, did you do anything um, different as a parent in terms of spending time with your son? I mean, we did as much as we could. Okay. Um, Tell us about that. Tell us about that month. I think we did more family game nights than normal. Um, he was working a lot. I would check in with him, you know, make sure he's, he's doing okay. That's when I started asking him, um, do you have friends at school that you can, you can hang out with? And if so, you're more than welcome to invite him over. Um, okay. I was, just more, I was more on point of the fact that he was, he was sad. Okay. And even though he was sad, did you feel like there was anything where he needed help or needed mental health treatment? No. Was there, was his loss of his friend being in his life um, anything that made you think he needed counseling or a therapist? Not to that extent, no. I'm going to unplug this so that we can go back to some questions, go to questions that don't involve exhibits, okay? Okay. Um, so we were we were talking earlier about the mother son gun range day, right? Correct. You've already told the jury how the gun was put in the car and taken out. Okay. Now, did you ever tell Brian Maloche about the mother son day at the range? I'm sure I mentioned it. Yeah. Did you ever tell Brian that the gun was in your vehicle? Yes. Okay. When did you tell Brian that the gun was in your vehicle? <laughs> On the day I went to the shooting range. Did you tell Brian you put the gun in your car the day the shooting happened? No. So when he testified to that, was that accurate? No, I think he was confused. Okay. Did you specifically tell him about the gun being put in your car that other time? Yes. Aside from that time that you drove to the range, was the gun ever in your car? No. Um, were you aware Brian had memory issues? Uh, no, I was not. Brian testified that he never met Ethan. Later in his testimony, he said he did. Did he ever meet Ethan? Yeah, a couple of times at the barn. Okay. And we went, um, he came to our house. He helped deliver a big TV that we got, and, and my son was there. Well, did you ever tell Brian anything about your son saying things or making you upset in any way like that? No. Did you ever tell Brian anything about he had mental health issues that you were worried about? No. So when we read your messages, which the prosecution admitted, the very the 77 pages, okay, it's fair to say the jury can read what you guys talked about and you reflect on all the... You, you talk about the past with Ethan, correct? Correct. Okay, so the jury can read those. We don't need to go through those. You agree? I agree. Okay. Um, so we talked, we got to Monday, we got, to, Monday is, um, two days after you guys go for the mother Sunday at the shooting range. Monday, Miss Fine leaves you the voicemail. We talked about that already. We talked about you talking to, to your son about it, right? Okay. I want to go to Tuesday, uh, the 30th. Okay. Okay. Do you remember Tuesday the 30th? I do. And that day we saw an exhibit of you going into work. That happened? Yes. And we heard lots of testimony already about you getting a call from Sean Hopkins. Correct. He left me a voicemail and I called him back. 
Okay. When you got the when you called back, um, Mr. Hopkins testified that um, he sent you something. What did he send you? Um, he sent me a copy of a math worksheet that had the scribbled out drawings on it. Okay. And I want to ask you the night before that scribbles out drawing um, thing came to you. Um, did you have any interactions with your son? Yes, we did. What were those about? Um, I saw in power school that he had an E in geometry. So we got an argument again about his grades. Um, we took his phone away and told him that he couldn't go to the shooting range until his grades, his grades were brought back up. Okay, so, so you guys had this argument the night before. I, we saw lots of messages where you thought everything was fine that Tuesday morning. Is that how you felt? Yeah. Okay. So when you got that when you got that math paper texted to you, do you recall saying to anything to Ethan on the phone? On speaker? Yeah, I asked him why he did why why he did that. Okay. What were you thinking at that point? Um I was actually I was actually kind of angry because I thought he was he did that in like defiance of us yelling him about missing assignments, and here he is drawing pictures on an empty assignment page in geometry. So you felt like it was specific we him sending you a message about the night before? Yeah. Um, is it fair to say you took it personally? Yeah, I did. Okay, so what did you do? Um, I had asked um, Mr. Hopkins to, if he had the original, and then he sent it to my email, which then I opened up and looked at it, and it's like, okay. What did you think when you saw that? I was a little concerned. Um, I, was, I was pretty concerned. He had asked um, for a parent to come to the school to meet with them. And at this time, I tried calling my husband to see if he could go because he was out in the area uh, working. And I couldn't get a hold of him, so I decided to go to the school. On the way to the school, um, he finally called me back, and he met me at the school, so we went together. Okay, and when you went into the school, what did you think was happening? Um, I thought he was going to get in trouble for what he drew on his assignment. I thought he was going to get, like, suspended. Um, I was expecting, like, a disciplinary meeting. Okay, how did you feel about what you saw on that paper? Um, I, felt con I, I felt concerned after seeing that. Okay, and so we saw um, that you sent pictures of the math papers to Kira, to, to Andy, uh, to Brian, you, it's fair to say you sent them around to people. I did. Okay, and to all those people, we've already seen all the exhibits, um, you expressed that concern. Correct. Okay, so what happens when you get to the school with, you and James arrive separately, I think the detective test testified that he was wrong at first thinking you went together, but you guys were separate, got there at the same time. Correct. Went in. What what was it like walking into the meeting with Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Ejack? Who was there? Um, so when we first got there, Mr. Hopkins met us out um, in front of the where the administration is and walked us back to uh, his counseling office. Uh, when we walked in, it was just him, and then my son was sitting in a chair in front of his desk um, working on something on his laptop. So when he walked in, he kind of showed us where to sit, and then... Um, we shook hands, he introduced himself, and started the meeting. Did, did you try to hug Ethan or do anything like that? I didn't. Okay. And when, um, how did that meeting go? Um, it, it was pretty, it was pretty nonchalant, it was pretty brief. Um, he started to tell, he, he basically filled me in on what my son and him were talking about for the last hour and a half. Um, he said that my son told him that he was feeling sad over the death of, a dog that we had, um, my mother-in-law, the loss of his friend. Um, so we talked. We talked a little bit about that. We, con we confirmed it. Um, we just said some, it's, we agreed it was hard on him. Um, he told us that he didn't feel um, my son was a risk, and actually gave him the option um, if he wanted to stay at school or go home. My son wanted to stay at school. So we all discussed. We all discussed that. Um, Did you feel like you were taking the position of I am leaving him at school, whether he can be here or not? No, absolutely not. Okay. Um, were you surprised or were you not surprised? Did you have any feelings about whether or not he could stay at school? Um, 
I didn't really, I, I thought the advice that they were giving us was the, a good advice. We, we talked about him being sad, and then um, he said being around peers usually helps. So we all agreed to that. Um, my son gets very stressed out when he does virtual school, so we agreed that it might stress him out more to do his school remotely the rest of the day. Um, but there is never a time where I would refuse to take him home. I could easily, if he wanted to go, take him with me. I had no issues with that. Okay, so ultimately, um, did you take the paper, a paper from the school? The counseling papers, yeah. Okay. There is a, like a stack, um, like maybe 10 sheets with multiple counselors listed on them. Okay. And um, were you planning to make, do anything with that sheet? Um, yeah, actually, we were going to start. I gave it to my husband out in the parking lot, and I told him I had phone calls at work the rest of the day. So I told him to start making calls um, once he got done doing his DoorDash. Okay. Now, the prosecution introduced and admitted um, an exhibit which was a search off of Yahoo about clinical depression um, treatments. Do you recall ever Google, well, I'm saying Googling, but do you recur, recall ever searching that, that topic? I don't, and I don't usually use Yahoo as a search engine. I always use Google, so I don't know. I don't, I don't recall it, no. Okay. Do you recall how, it, how or if you ever saw anything um, on on Yahoo about clinical depression. I don't remember specifically seeing anything. Um, I might have looked at something when my husband was going through a really hard time. After his mother passed away, he was um, he he was drinking a little bit more than usual, and you just tell it, he was just, he wasn't right. So I might have looked at something at that time, seeing if he was depressed, but not. I, I don't know where Yahoo came from. You don't know how the Yahoo came to no. be? Okay. When you're on Facebook and Instagram and all those things, do you ever hit the clickbait stuff? Um, it, sometimes on accident. Sometimes I do on purpose. Okay, so that search on Yahoo, you don't remember ever putting that in the search bar? No. Okay. Um, but you are saying it's possible you looked at it, is that? It's possible. Okay. All right. Um... So let's go back. So you're at the meeting. How did the meeting end? Um, so we all decided that Ethan was, or my son was going to go back to his class. So we wrote a pass to go back to class. Um, after he left, we, all four of us were in the meeting, and we kind of, he, they asked if we had any questions, and we did not. And then I said, I'm going to go back to work. And we left, and I went to work, and my husband did DoorDash, and... Did you mean to be abrupt about ending the meeting? I didn't think I was abrupt. Did you think you ended the meeting? I think it just automatically ended when they asked if we had any questions, and I said no. Okay. Um, so when there was testimony about that... Um, I'm sorry, strike that. Let me ask Ms. Smith. I don't want to interrupt you. I'm looking for a natural break. We here. could do it now. Well, does Jerry need a break? Yeah, I, yeah that's fine. I'm trying to respond to consider it. No, we can go anytime. That's fine. Okay, I don't. I don't want to interrupt you. You're not. You're fine. That's okay. fine. So, can you take a break until about five minutes? Second. Okay. All right for the jury. Is it okay if I grab these? Sure. Okay, Jennifer, I'm gonna grab these from you. I don't usually like to interrupt people's direct, but I know you have pregnant men and, um, and they've been at since 12 30. So, so we're going to take about 10 minutes right to the five after three. Okay. Well, Judge, based upon the testimony, I need to pull some exhibits, so it'll be longer than 10 minutes. I'd like to get right into cross after direct. So I'm going to do that right now, but it'll be longer than 10 minutes. Okay. If that's okay, we just, we're going to need some time, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I, you, have, you have quite a bit of direct left, I think. You I have, have quite a bit for yourself. Right? I, have, I, don't, I don't know how to do I've gotten through three quarters of it. So I, okay. I'd say I have a quarter of it left. Okay. And a lot of it uh, is probably going to go pretty fast because the exhibits speak for themselves and they've already admitted videos of all of it. So, okay. All right. Um, so you can take them down. And um, can, you, can you guys let me know that I, I don't like to let them sit very long. If you let me know. Sure. I mean, you're not talking about... 
half an hour, an hour and a half, right? Uh, not an hour, no, but... There's, uh, uh, we're trying to avoid having standing up and saying we need a, a time and having to take another break, but... No, I get it. We'll go as fast as we can. We just, there's a lot of things to testify about, I think, that Mr. Keyes okay. wanted to... Right. Well, I just... Your Honor, I moved fast with their exhibits. Oh, I kept good, going. I didn't take breaks it's in between. Good. It's good. I'm, I'm more concerned about the jury sitting than anything. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank okay. you. All right. Jennifer, they're going to take you down. They're going to take you down, and then they're going to bring you back up, okay? Well, taking her stand, uh, taking the stand, rather, in her own defense, you were just watching Jennifer Crumbly, the mom of the Michigan high school shooter, Ethan Crumbly, uh, up in the stand there as she faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter in connection with the shooting that killed four students. Her husband will have his own trial uh, coming up soon as well. Sometimes emotional Crumbly there recounting the days and months preceding that shooting, what exactly she knew and didn't know about her son, and when asked who was in charge of that gun in their house, that gun that was used in that school shooting, she simply said, my husband. For more, let's bring in our legal contributor and trial attorney, Brian Buckmeyer, along with our Phil Lipoff, who, of course, has been following this uh, since the very beginning. Boy, so much to talk about, gentlemen, from the emails to the text messages to the red flags, so many specifics about uh, her life, her relationship with her son, and what led up to the day that shooting uh, took place. And I think, Phil, one thing that really stood out to me was the fact that um, the signs were there. I mean, he was talking about paranoia and voices in his head and calling 911 for help. I mean, just as a parent, I'm sitting here and we've talked about this thinking, how can you not be tuned in when it's even there on devices and conversation? I mean, it's such a lesson to parents about you know how involved we should be. Absolutely, and uh, I know Brian's a dad too, and I'm a parent of two kids. I've gone through that that phase with them. And sure, you're thinking about that as you're listening to her testify, but it, you see what she and her attorney did there, especially when it comes to what you're talking about, Kira, about the demons and things flying off of shelves and him being very uncomfortable at home alone. She claims that started when he was younger, and he believed, you know, he was into this Ouija board and he believed that the house was haunted and it became a big joke of theirs over the years. That's how she explained that away. Some might call that a, a big red flag. She says it was a family joke to the point where, you know, she hit the circuit breaker once to scare him. Um, so, you know, that's going to be up to the jury to, to sort out. But certainly there were a lot of other red flags that they, they discussed leading up to this testimony. And, and Brian, it's, it's generally considered a high-risk strategy, right, in most criminal trials for the defendant to take the witness stand, in this case, in her own defense. She opens herself to cross-examination, and, and she's the accused. She doesn't have to prove anything. So uh, what do you make of the choice that, that the defense has made to put her on the witness stand and, and expose what, you know, may be bad parenting but may not meet the elements the prosecution must prove to show the, the jury that she committed involuntary manslaughter. Well, Terry, we are, Phil and I are sitting here listening to the opening statements and as well as the, the direct examination. And I told Phil, he's like, hey, there's some good points here. He's like, wait for the cross-examination. Because as I said, it's very easy to direct someone using questions that they know the answers to already and make them look great. What I see in a lot of this direct examination is a dual-edged sword. The beginning, I think like the first 45 minutes was just this prop up of, she's a great mom, look at all these photos. Uh, Phil, I mean, my son's only a year and a half, so Phil's got the teenage kids and understands, hey, at a certain age, they don't want to take pictures with you. And that made a lot of sense. But I think ultimately he's going to come back and cross damage and say, if you were this good of a parent, how did you miss all of this? I think she's going to kind of giving herself a lot of rope here, but also that rope could come back uh, and, and harm her in a major way come cross examination. Bill and Brian, stay right there. More ABC News Live right now. Michigan high school shooter testifying in her own trial, the latest from court, as she now faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter after giving her son access to that murder weapon. 
And I did not handle this right. That's what Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said as he took questions for the first time since being hospitalized for prostate cancer and not telling the President of the United States about it. What he told reporters today as the U.S. mulls a military response now to that deadly attack on American troops in Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, Jennifer Crumbly has testified in her own case. She's on the witness stand right now. She's the mother of the Michigan school shooter, Ethan Crumbly, uh, who uh, was in Oxford, Michigan, when he opened fire on classmates. Jennifer Crumbly took the stand in her own defense after being accused of giving her son access to his murder weapon. She stands charged with involuntary manslaughter for not... Uh, taking better care of that weapon that her son used to kill his classmates. She didn't show a lot of emotion there, um, but she did talk about getting hives and hot flushes when she got really nervous. You can see that right there uh, as she's looking at pieces of evidence that she was asked about. Um, and she was asked also specifically who was in charge of that gun that was in their house, the one that Ethan Crumbly used to carry out that mass shooting. And she said very simply, my husband. She faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter now in that shooting that killed four students back in 2021. So joining us now, ABC News, Trevor Alt, who's been inside the courtroom. ABC's Phil Lipoff. He's been following this case from the beginning, along with legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer. So, uh, Trevor, you were in court for the testimony of Jennifer uh, Crumbly. How did, how did it seem to you, and, and how did the jury react, if you can read that? Uh, I think that they're paying rapt attention so far, Terry, and this so far has played out the way that we would expect defense attorneys to lay out this uh, examination when you have Jennifer Crumbly facing these very serious charges, is that they took their time in building up the history with her son and having all of those photos and the Facebook posts. She admitted that she posts on Facebook far too much, talking about all the times and the trips uh, and the fun that she'd had with her son and with her husband, too. And just uh, in the past 15 minutes or so, is when they really kind of got into what I think is going to be the crux of this whole argument, which is when her story begins to split with the school officials. And the reason I think that's going to be so important is because her argument up to this point, as the prosecution has presented troubling journal entries and text messages from their son, uh, she was, uh, at least she claims, unaware of all of that. But she is aware of the meeting that happened the morning of the shooting. When the school called her and showed her the disturbing drawings that her son had done on his math worksheet, where the counselor says that they were required to get their son help for his mental health within the next 48 hours. Now, the school officials have already testified that they felt it was very strange how the parents did not seem all that interested in getting their son help for his mental health that morning and that the meeting ended abruptly after just 12 minutes. Today, we heard from Jennifer Crumbly's perspective. She thought that the meeting was nonchalant, and while she felt she didn't end the meeting, she said that it ended when those counselors asked, do you have any questions? for us and that comes after they said you are required to get your son help for his mental health in 48 hours do you have any questions and Jennifer Crumbly admits they said no and then they left that might not uh bode too well with the jury but of course as we've heard so much from our legal analysts this is going to come down to the cross-examination it's what kind of we've been waiting for this entire trial it is going to be incredibly intense because there is a mountain of warning signs and red flags leading up to the shooting whether or not jennifer crumbly saw all of it is certainly going to be a question that's asked Right, and that's my next question to you, Brian. I mean, what do you think about Jennifer Crumbly's attorney here? Because you you look at these text exchanges between Ethan and his friend, and you immediately think, oh my gosh, something horrible is about to happen. He's admitting to hearing voices in his head and paranoia and anxiety, and, and um, yet yet mom says... I had no idea. I, I, I never I never saw those things. Does it look like they're trying to not deny the fact that he was a troubled child, but that she just was a disengaged parent and this just simply wasn't her fault? 
Yeah, and, and Kira, that's ultimately the argument here. It's about the foreseeability of what Jennifer Crumbly knew at the time uh, prior to the shooting that the defense is really making the argument of. Distinguishing between what the mother knew, whether it be at the meeting, the text messages between the shooter and Jennifer, and that anything else that she was not aware of was something that she could not foresee uh, the events playing out on that November 30th of 2021. And so I think in that regard, it is a good argument. But some of the responses here, I go back and forth with. And even here, as I'm sitting here with Phil, I'm thinking, hey, I would cross-examine her this way. I would cross-examine her that way. And I think this cross-examination is going to be robust. Uh, I, I look at the timeline of the photos that lead all the way up, up until the actual shooting of this is a good mother, this is her doing things that all parents would do with their child. But if, and this is what I say in terms of, of a cross-examination potentially, if you were this close with your son and you saw all this positive in them, when that light started flickering behind his eye and he started becoming depressed, and as she said, she felt pretty concerned going into that meeting, why not say, guys, my son has a gun. He's drawing pictures. He's saying, please help me. The voices won't stop. It's not a joke at the house anymore. This is something that's, I won't say, I won't use this word, but it's, it's pouring now into the school. I'm not going to just say I don't have any questions when you say I need to get him mental health help. I'm going to say I need to take him now because gun plus this could be harming him or others. And I think that's going to be a difficult part for the defense. Uh, and, and the defense, you know, is, is facing this charge of involuntary manslaughter. So the prosecution has to pr prove that Jennifer Crumbly's actions caused the death of the victim, uh, that they were grossly negligent, and that there's no lawful excuse or justification. And, and Phil, I, I'd, I'd like to go to you on that. It, it sounds like part of her defense is going to be, you know, what mother looks at her child and thinks he, she's looking at a murderer? It certainly seems that way so far, and, and that's what we've seen when other parents of school shooters uh, have been questioned about it. It's been two hours of this direct examination, and as Brian and I are sitting here and listening to it, about an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes was spent on family pictures and camping and Christmas and cooking together and first day of eighth grade. They showed so many pictures of what any parent would relate to. I have all those pictures with my kids too. I'm sure the both of you do as well. And that's obviously the strategy there, trying to make her out to be any mom. But as Trevor uh, pointed out, when her story starts to diverge with the story of the school and she has a different idea of what that meeting was like and the first time you hear her use the word concerned as Brian points out was on the day of the shooting and if she was concerned why was there no help that day uh, for her child why did she not bring him home from school she said Ethan wanted to stay at school and that's where he felt more comfortable but we're all parents here you know maybe as a parent that day you say hey it's time for a break these are the kind of things that the jury is going to be looking to ask mm. so Brian what more needs to be proven here besides the fact that maybe she was just a terrible parent? I think what we're going to see, and we kind of got a glimpse of it from the prosecution saying they need 10 minutes to prepare with their exhibits. I think there's going to be a juxtaposition of what she testified on direct and really grilling her on cross-examination to say, no, these signs were clear and apparent and you ignored them. It's one thing to say that signs didn't exist that you didn't see the, the signs, or that signs were there and you didn't put enough credit into them. I think that last category is what the prosecution is trying to gear this case towards, uh, because they have to do a distinguishing between you all jurors, everyone who's watching this trial are probably great parents or good parents, whoever it may be, but Jennifer Crumbly is a unique parent in of herself and that her actions were completely egregious, uh, negligent, and she was the cause of this, because even though she didn't buy the gun, she had the care of the gun, she held the gun, she stored it in her car without the proper requirements and believed that her husband, because he told her that uh, he took the gun from the car and stored it properly, that she was negligent in her actions with the gun, her son, and the red flags that she ignored. All right, it's quite a case, very interesting and important case. And, and Brian, Trevor, and Phil, thanks very much for being with us on it. Well, we're gonna turn the page now from an apology to taking action. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin held his first press conference since his secretive hospitalization earlier uh, this year. Austin making it very clear the Pentagon is preparing to retaliate for that deadly attack on U.S. troops in Jordan. Take a listen. We will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. 
and we will respond when we choose, where we choose, and how we choose. So the secretary finally taking questions for the first time from reporters there since his cancer diagnosis and treatment, which was initially kept secret, as you know, from the White House. Our national policy reporter, Ann Flaherty, joins us from the Pentagon. Also, foreign correspondent Marcus Moore, who's in Amman, Jordan, joins us for more. So, Ann, let's just start with you. Um, Secretary Austin uh, promising that the U.S. is going to retaliate, but we still don't know when and how. Yeah, it, Kira, he was certainly short on operational details. Just speaking in broad strokes, he said that his goal is to try to contain the violence that's happening in the Middle East. They certainly don't want a wider war. He said specifically, we are not at war with Iran. But at the same time, he said that they want to degrade the Houthis' abilities and other militants from striking the U.S. So I did speak with a U.S. official this morning who said this is going to unfold across several days. You could see this in multiple countries. We are expecting strikes possibly in Iraq and Syria possibly even Yemen as well. Kira. Uh, thank you for that. And let me turn to Marcus. Now, Marcus, there's some news today in the Israeli-Hamas uh, war and the efforts by powers in the region and the United States and others to have a lasting ceasefire with a hostage deal. What's the latest on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, Terry, this is potentially encouraging encouraging news, especially for the families who have been uh, so worried about their loved ones. Right now, there are more than 100 people being held hostage by Hamas and other groups. And we are learning from a Qatari official tonight that uh, Hamas has received a proposal for a truce for hostage release, but, but it has not yet uh, responded. Uh, that official uh, who has knowledge of the, ne the, nego the negotiations that are underway right now saying, quote, uh, there's no deal yet. Uh, Hamas has received the proposal positively, but we are waiting uh, for their response. Uh, and, and Terry, it is a, it's, a, it's a glimmer of hope uh, as we watch this uh, continue uh, to unfold. And the Qatari government, as you know, has been uh, playing a key role as a mediator in the midst of all of this. And so we'll watch uh, very closely for uh, the next move from Hamas. Uh, but again, uh, this could be uh, potentially more good news for those, those families who have been uh, so worried for so many months. Mm. All right, Marcus, and appreciate it. Thanks so much. A lot happening. Well, at least three people are dead, nine others injured after a hangar collapsed at a Boise, Idaho airport. Officials there say that everyone on that site is now accounted for. Investigators are still trying to figure out, though, what happened. Our Melissa Don is there in Boise with more. So, Melissa, what's the latest on the investigation and, and what do we know about the victims and the survivors at this point? Uh, definitely, Terry and Kira. So investigators are now here on site. We've seen some of the OSHA folks actually putting up a fence here because behind me is that airplane hangar that collapsed a lot total structure that we've been just looking at and seeing this morning. Essentially what we were knowing about was that it was under construction. So there were some uh, several cranes that were out here as well. We've also spoken casually some other construction workers from other sites have come in and mentioned, you know, is there a possibility it was some of the cranes that were an issue? Was it a malfunction there? There was also windy conditions. Was weather playing a part? So those are all examples of things that uh, Cal, uh, the OSHA and some of the investigators here will be looking into. Uh, as to what exactly caused this hangar to collapse. And again, it's just sizable because to see this, when you look at the wreckage behind me, it just collapsed inward. That is what one of the witnesses told me, basically like a house of cards, all of it suddenly collapsing. And then when I preface that and I say that, Kira and Terry, it is so daunting. It is traumatizing to think about what these Idaho firefighters, first responders had to go through when they arrived here really working quickly and as fast as they could because they had to peel, pull, go right, go in and pull people out of the rubble. That difficult task at any time. It happened here at Idaho, local time, mountain time, five o'clock. So into the night, they were working to pull people out of this uh, rubble. Unfortunately, three people here did not survive. They had five others that were sent to the hospital. We're still monitoring their conditions at this time. Terry, Kira. All right, Melissa, we'll follow it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, coming up, a desperate search for suspects is underway after a violent attack on police officers in New York City. The latest on the manhunt when we return. Whenever news breaks.
We are here in Israel, a nation at war, after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. So developing right now a desperate search for suspects following a violent attack involving police officers in New York City. Two officers were assaulted, take a look at this, while attempting to break up a disorderly crowd outside a Manhattan migrant shelter. This is video that's been released by the NYPD. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, that, that is appalling. shocking and appalling to look at. What's the latest on this investigation? It is a disturbing piece of, of video. And for the police, they say that no officer should ever come under assault like that. Seven people have been arrested so far, and the police are looking for five additional individuals that were believed to have been involved. This all happened on Saturday when the police had approached uh, what they said was a disorderly crowd outside a migrant shelter in Times Square. And then as they moved in to take someone into custody for doing something, what, what that something is wasn't exactly clear, that's when uh, this scuffle broke out that, that you can see things got violent. The officers uh, were down on the ground with one of the suspects. Others were, were kicking and punching them. Uh, and for police, they say this is completely unacceptable. Uh, most of those involved are believed to be asylum seekers. So it raised additional questions in a city that's already been struggling with an influx of some 200,000 migrants sent to New York from the southern border. Yeah, they aren't getting asylum. That's probably going to say, clearly, this is a much bigger story. Just yeah. It's not just an attack on these officers, but it's our overall problem of what's happening at the border and immigration and how it's impacting New York City. And Overwhelming resources, right. law enforcement, no question. We'll and stay on fact, top of it. Yes, Aaron, please. No, the governor was asked, uh, Kira, whether you know these are kinds of the kinds of people that should be deported by the United States. And the governor said that's worth looking into. So it really has sparked a debate. Uh, it has also triggered a debate about uh, crime and, and, and bail because most of the suspects that have been charged and arrested were released without bail. And the police department is certainly unhappy about that. Our first reaction is why is there even a debate here? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the prosecutors are taking a look at not only this video, but they've obtained other video of mm. the assault. And they want to be sure that mm. they understand each person's role because yep. there, there might be a degree of difference. Sure. Uh, there are also questions about identities, ages. They want to make sure they have all of that right before pressing forward with, uh, with, with charges that may warrant uh, uh, a, a no bail or some kind of, you know, remanded circumstance. Of course. Got it.
Appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you. Well, drivers in Washington state are on edge after a series of freeway shootings there in recent weeks. Authorities are now confirming that seven freeway shootings in just the first month of this year have occurred. The search is on now for at least two suspects. And in the latest incident, that happened just yesterday. ABC News correspondent Alex Stone joins us now. Alex, this is just a nightmare. What's the latest? Hey there, Terry. Yeah, the, the latest on this one, yesterday afternoon, a, a driver and a passenger, they were in an Acura. They were driving down a, a road in King County in the Seattle area. Somebody in a Dodge Charger, the, the passenger in that car pulled up, started firing at them three times. The, they called 911, the, the victims did. A police helicopter went up above it. They were able to, to track the, the vehicle. They uh, tracked it all the way into an apartment complex. The people inside got out. They changed their clothes. They changed their vehicle. They left the gun, and then they were out of there, and they don't know where they went. Now, here is the thing. There have been seven of these in January, but they don't believe they were connected, any of these seven, that, that what has been going on mysteriously, uh, they, they think, has been individual incidents, individual shootings. The suspect descriptions have been different every time. The vehicle descriptions have been different every time. Nobody has been injured in any of these, incredibly, after uh, seven shootings uh, on freeways around Seattle. But what's prompting it? Police say they don't know. They think they're not connected. This latest one being yesterday. And again, luckily, nobody injured. My goodness. Unfortunately, and it's something we're dealing here in our nation's capital. A lot of these kids on, on social media get involved at these competitions, a lot of them involving crimes like carjackings, et cetera. I talked to some police detectives about a month ago about this. It's happening here in our area. I wonder if this is some sort of challenge that they're seeing on social media. Unfortunately, it's, it's something that is, uh, that's going on. Mm. Well, Alex, let us know as you learn more. Clearly, we want to know more about it. You got it. Thanks. Well, coming up, Walmart is announcing a major expansion, how it could affect a Walmart near you when we return. Tonight, the U.S. plan to strike back for the deaths of three American soldiers, plus the dangerous storm saturating the West. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. The ideal male physique is tall, dark, and handsome. Money can buy you a lot of things. Money can't make you taller, right? We're bringing you behind the scenes of the newest cosmetic surgery. I feel fat. As a man, it's like, man, I wish I was taller. We see men who are taller as the alpha. I went from 5'9". Right now, I wish shoes, I'm 6'1". Everybody's freaked out by it on the basis of what it's called, leg lengthening. You only live once, so go for it. The big business of getting tall, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Memphis, I'm Steve Lissonsani. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Thanks for streaming with us. Walmart is announcing a major expansion, opening new stores and investing in its workforce, you they know, say. It's been years since Walmart has actually opened a new store, and they're focusing on online sales, but now they decide to make this multi-billion dollar investment in new locations across the country, uh, betting that uh, brick and mortar is a big part of the future of shopping. Our Elizabeth Schulze <laughs> actually spoke with the retail giants. U.S. CEO joins us now with more. So give us a scoop. You know, guys, this is a bit of back to the future when it comes to Walmart. It's been since 2021 since they've opened new locations, and now they've announced this major expansion where 150 stores will be added across the country in various cities. They said urban areas, but also in more rural areas to try to basically make the point that when people are shopping in the future, and they're already doing it now, first they're going online, but they still want that in-store experience. So what Walmart is doing, a little bit in, in the heels of competition, obviously from Amazon, the big behemoth there, is to try to add more stores that also serve as distribution centers. So kind of this mix of e-commerce and in-store, that's what Walmart's U.S. CEO told us is the future of shopping. They're calling it omni-channel. You can call it whatever you want, but in a lot of ways, it is that experience that so many people had before, realizing they don't want to give it up entirely to go online, guys. So the retailer says that artificial intelligence is already shaping its day-to-day -day operations, like keeping track of how much inventory is left and what's in the store. Uh, what did the CEO tell you about that? Well, I think this is important because we talk about artificial intelligence a lot, so much in the abstract, but we really tried to press the U.S. CEO about what does this look like in practice? How does this artificial intelligence change what employees are doing and what shoppers are doing? And they said that really it is making work more efficient, that they're doing these kind of jobs like tracking sales or tracking where products are in the store, figuring out exactly what's left and when orders need to be placed in advance. And we asked, well, isn't there a risk then that some of those jobs that people are doing and that we're doing that now could be replaced? Here's what the CEO told us. You know, over, over time, um, we believe that we'll have more jobs than we do today as we continue to grow. Now, the jobs will change. So we see this as, as a way to improve productivity, but more importantly, to help associates upskill, learn new skills, and, and perform at a different level. So a little bit of an admittance there that, yeah, the jobs are going to change because of this new technology, but the hope is that it will also create new jobs. And I just want to say, guys, they are making a point to try to show that because the work is changing because of technology, so is the pay. Store managers at Walmart can now make up to $400,000 every year, guys. Wow. Ooh. That's pretty that good. My, my hunch, kid. though, is that they're going to start serious regulation of artificial, artificial intelligence once it starts taking CEO jobs. Right, <laughs> that's sure. What, that's what that's it's going to take. Exactly. That's what it's going to take. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you. We always love your insight on the business stories. Absolutely. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops, and we'll be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Tonight, the U.S. plan to strike back for the deaths of three American soldiers, plus the dangerous storms saturating the West. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Oh my God, it's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. Ingma Kortelak, one of the biggest unclimbed rock faces on the planet. Now I'm starting to get very excited. If we manage to climb Ingma Kortelak, It'll be the biggest first ascent we've ever done. Oh my God, it's so scary! Oh. Ultimately, what's at stake with climbing? This is not what I signed up for. It's always your life. Rock, 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 rock! Ice, ice, ice!
do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. high school shooter testifying in her own trial the latest from court as she now faces four counts of involuntary van slaughter after giving her son access to that murder weapon and i did not handle this right that's what defense secretary lloyd austin said as he took questions for the first time since being hospitalized for prostate cancer and not telling the president of the united states about it what he told reporters today as the U.S. mulls a military response now to that deadly attack on American troops in Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, Jennifer Crumbly has testified in her own case. She's on the witness stand right now. She's the mother of the Michigan school shooter Ethan Crumbly, uh, who uh, was in Oxford, Michigan, when he opened fire on classmates. Jennifer Crumbly took the stand in her own defense after being accused of giving her son access to his murder weapon. She stands charged with involuntary manslaughter for not uh, taking better care of that weapon that her son used to kill his classmates. She didn't show a lot of emotion there, um, but she did talk about getting hives and hot flashes when she got really nervous. You can see that right there uh, as she's looking at pieces of evidence that she was asked about. Um, and she was asked also specifically who was in charge of that gun that was in their house, the one that Ethan Crumbly used to carry out that mass shooting. And she said very simply, my husband, she faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter now in that shooting that killed four students back in 2021. So joining us now, ABC News, Trevor Alt, who's been inside the courtroom. ABC's Phil Lipoff, he's been following this case from the beginning, along with legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer. So uh, Trevor, you were in court for the testimony of Jennifer uh, Crumbly. How did, how did it seem to you, and, and how did the jury react, if you can read that? Uh, I think that they're paying rapt attention so far, Terry, and this so far has played out the way that we would expect defense attorneys to lay out this uh, examination when you have Jennifer Crumbly facing these very serious charges, is that they took their time in building up the history with her son and having all of those photos and the Facebook posts. She admitted that she posts on Facebook far too much, talking about all the times and the trips uh, and the fun that she'd had with her son and with her husband, too. And just uh, in the past 15 minutes or so, is when they really kind of got into what I think is going to be the crux of this whole argument, which is when her story begins to split with the school officials. And the reason I think that's going to be so important is because her argument up to this point, as the prosecution has presented troubling journal entries and text messages from their son, uh, she was, uh, at least she claims, unaware of all of that. But she is aware of the meeting that happened the morning of the shooting. When the school called her and showed her the disturbing drawings that her son undone, had done on his math worksheet, where the says that they were required to get their son help for his mental health within the next 48 hours. Now, the school officials have already testified that they felt it was very strange how the parents did not seem all that interested in getting their son help for his mental health that morning and that the meeting ended abruptly after just 12 minutes. Today, we heard from Jennifer Crumbly's perspective. She thought that the meeting was nonchalant, and while she felt she didn't end the meeting, she said that it ended when those counselors asked, do you have any questions? for us and that comes after they said you are required to get your son help for his mental health in 48 hours do you have any questions and jennifer crumbly admits they said no and then they left that might not uh bode too well with the jury but of course as we've heard so much from our legal analysts this is going to come down to the cross-examination it's what kind of we've been waiting for this entire trial it is going to be incredibly intense because there is a mountain of warning signs and red flags leading up to the shooting whether or not jennifer crumbly saw all of it is certainly going to be a question that's asked Right, and that's my next question to you, Brian. I mean, what do you think about Jennifer Crumbly's attorney here? Because you you look at these text exchanges between Ethan and his friend, and you immediately think, oh my gosh, something horrible is about to happen. He's admitting to hearing voices in his head and paranoia and anxiety, and, and um, yet, yet mom says, 
I had no idea. I, I, I never I never saw those things. Does it look like they're trying to not deny the fact that he was a troubled child, but that she just was a disen disengaged parent and this just simply wasn't her fault? Yeah, and, and Kira, that's ultimately the argument here. It's about the foreseeability of what Jennifer Crumbly knew at the time uh, prior to the shooting that the defense is really making the argument of. Distinguishing between what the mother knew, whether it be at the meeting, the text messages between the shooter and Jennifer, and that anything else that she was not aware of was something that she could not foresee uh, the events playing out on that November 30th of 2021. And so I think in that regard, it is a good argument. But some of the responses here, I go back and forth with and even here as I'm sitting here with Phil I'm thinking hey I would cross-examine her this way I would cross-examine her that way and I think this chronic examination is going to be robust uh, I, I look at the timeline of the photos that lead all the way up up until the actual shooting of this is a good mother this is her doing things that all parents would do with their child but if and this is what I say in terms of, of a cross-examination potentially if you were this close with your son and you saw all this positive in them. When that light started flickering behind his eye and he started becoming depressed, and as she said, she felt pretty concerned going into that meeting, why not say, guys, my son has a gun. He's drawing pictures. He's saying, please help me. The voices won't stop. It's not a joke at the house anymore. This is something that's, I won't say, I won't use this word, but it's, it's pouring now into the school. I'm not going to just say I don't have any questions when you say I need to get him mental health help. I'm going to say I need to take him now because gun plus this could be harming him or others. And I think that's going to be a difficult part for the defense. Uh, and, and the defense, you know, is, is facing this charge of involuntary manslaughter. So the prosecution has to pr prove that Jennifer Crumbly's actions caused the death of the victim, uh, that they were grossly negligent and that there's no lawful excuse or justification. And, and Phil, I, I'd, I'd like to go to you on that. It, it sounds like part of her defense is going to be, you know, what mother looks at her child and thinks he, she's looking at a murderer? It certainly seems that way so far. And, and that's what we've seen when other parents of school shooters uh, have been questioned about it. It's been two hours of this direct examination. And as Brian and I are sitting here and listening to it, about an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes was spent on family pictures and camping and Christmas and cooking together and first day of eighth grade. They showed so many pictures of what any parent would relate to. I have all those pictures with my kids too. I'm sure the both of you do as well. And that's obviously the strategy there, trying to make her out to be any mom. But as Trevor uh, pointed out, when her story starts to diverge with the story of the school and she has a different idea of what that meeting was like and the first time you hear her use the word concerned as Brian points out was on the day of the shooting and if she was concerned why was there no help that day uh, for her child why did she not bring him home from school she said Ethan wanted to stay at school and that's where he felt more comfortable but we're all parents here you know maybe as a parent that day you say hey it's time for a break these are the kind of things that the jury is going to be looking to ask mm. so Brian what more needs to be proven here besides the fact that maybe she was just a terrible parent? I think what we're going to see, and we kind of got a glimpse of it from the prosecution saying they need 10 minutes to prepare with their exhibits. I think there's going to be a juxtaposition of what she testified on direct and really grilling her on cross-examination to say, no, these signs were clear and apparent and you ignored them. It's one thing to say that signs didn't exist that you didn't see the, the signs, or that signs were there and you didn't put enough credit into them. I think that last category is what the prosecution is trying to gear this case towards, uh, because they have to do a distinguishing between you all jurors, everyone who's watching this trial are probably great parents or good parents, whoever it may be, but Jennifer Crumbly is a unique parent in of herself and that her actions were completely egregious, uh, negligent, and she was the cause of this, because even though she didn't buy the gun, she had the care of the gun, she held the gun, she stored it in her car without the proper requirements and believed that her husband, because he told her that uh, he took the gun from the car and stored it properly, that she was negligent in her actions with the gun, her son, and the red flags that she ignored. All right, it's quite a case, very interesting and important case. And, and Brian, Trevor, and Phil, thanks very much for being with us on it. Well, we're going to turn the page now from an apology to taking action. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin held his first press conference since his secretive hospitalization 
earlier uh, this year, Austin making it very clear the Pentagon is preparing to retaliate for that deadly attack on U.S. troops in Jordan. Take a listen. We will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. And we will respond when we choose, where we choose, and how we choose. So the secretary finally taking questions for the first time from reporters there since his cancer diagnosis and treatment, which was initially kept secret, as you know, from the White House. Our national policy reporter, Ann Flaherty, joins us from the Pentagon. Also, foreign correspondent Marcus Moore, who's in Amman, Jordan, joins us for more. So, Ann, let's just start with you. Um, Secretary Austin uh, promising that the U.S. is going to retaliate, but we still don't know when and how. Yeah, Kira, he was certainly short on operational details. Just speaking in broad strokes, he said that his goal is to try to contain the violence that's happening in the Middle East. They certainly don't want a wider war. He said specifically, we are not at war with Iran. But at the same time, he said that they want to degrade the Houthis' abilities and other militants from striking the U.S. So I did speak with a U.S. official this morning who said this is going to unfold across several days. You could see this in multiple countries. We are expecting strikes possibly in Iraq and Syria possibly even Yemen as well. Kira. Uh, thank you for that. And let me turn to Marcus. Now, Marcus, there's some news today in the Israeli uh, Hamas war and the efforts by powers in the region and the United States and others to have a lasting ceasefire with a hostage deal. What's the latest on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, Terry, this is potentially encouraging encouraging news, especially for the families who have been uh, so worried about their loved ones. Right now, there are more than 100 people being held hostage by Hamas and other groups. And we are learning from a Qatari official tonight that uh, Hamas has received a proposal for a truce for hostage release, but, but it has not yet uh, responded. Uh, that official uh, who has knowledge of the, ne the, nego the negotiations that are underway right now saying, quote, uh, there's no deal yet. Uh, Hamas has received the proposal positively, but we are waiting uh, for their response. Uh, and, and Terry, it is a, it's, a, it's a glimmer of hope uh, as we watch this uh, continue uh, to unfold. And the Qatari government, as you know, has been uh, playing a key role as a mediator in the midst of all of this. And so we'll watch uh, very closely for uh, the next move from Hamas. Uh, but again, uh, this could be uh, potentially more good news for those, those families who have been uh, so worried for so many months. Mm. All right, Marcus, and appreciate it. Thanks so much. A lot happening. Well, at least three people are dead, nine others injured after a hangar collapsed at a Boise, Idaho airport. Officials there say that everyone on that site is now accounted for. Investigators are still trying to figure out, though, what happened. Our Melissa Don is there in Boise with more. So, Melissa, what's the latest on the investigation, and, and what do we know about the victims and the survivors at this point? Uh, definitely, Terry and Kira. So investigators are now here on site. We've seen some of the OSHA folks actually putting up a fence here because behind me is that airplane hangar that collapsed a lot total structure that we've been just looking at and seeing this morning. Essentially what we were knowing about was that it was under construction. So there were some uh, several cranes that were out here as well. We've also spoken casually some other construction workers from other sites have come in and mentioned, you know, is there a possibility it was some of the cranes that were an issue? Was it a malfunction there? There was also windy conditions. Was weather playing a part? So those are all examples of things that uh, Cal, uh, the OSHA and some of the investigators here will be looking into. Uh, as to what exactly caused this hangar to collapse. And again, it's just sizable because to see this, when you look at the wreckage behind me, it just collapsed inward. That is what one of the witnesses told me, basically like a house of cards, all of it suddenly collapsing. And then when I preface that and I say that, Kira and Terry, it is so daunting. It is traumatizing to think about what these Idaho firefighters, first responders had to go through when they arrived here really working quickly and as fast as they could because they had to peel, pull, go right, go in and pull people out of the rubble. That difficult task at any time. It happened here in Idaho, local time, mountain time, five o'clock. So into the night, they were working to pull people out of this uh, rubble. Unfortunately, three people here did not survive. They had five others that were sent to the hospital. We're still monitoring their conditions at this time. Terry, Kira.
All right, Melissa, we'll follow it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, coming up, a desperate search for suspects is underway after a violent attack on police officers in New York City. The latest on the manhunt when we return. Friday, a stalker hunting women. It makes me shudder. A young mother vanishes. A series of apparently unconnected crimes. Another mother gunned down. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do with this? And then... A silver minivan pulls up. Oh, and he reached for the gun and I jumped out of the car. I'm the one that got away. The murderer in the minivan. I get goosebumps to think what they found. All new 2020, Friday night on ABC. Tonight, the U.S. plan to strike back for the deaths of three American soldiers, plus the dangerous storms saturating the West. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Tomorrow morning, wake up with Usher. It's going to be a great show. What will he reveal about his new music and his epic halftime show? Plus, she just got nominated for an Oscar. So what's Annette Benning doing next? She's coming to GMA Live tomorrow on... Good morning, America. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Stream ABC News Live, counting down every day to the most consequential election of our lifetime. Now just one year away. If it's politics in 2024, ABC News Live will take you there. Streaming free wherever you stream your news. So developing right now a desperate search for suspects following a violent attack involving officers in New York City. Two officers were assaulted. Take a look at this. While attempting to break up a disorderly crowd outside a Manhattan migrant shelter. This is video that's been released by the NYPD. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, that, that is appalling. shocking and appalling to look at. What's the latest on this investigation? It is a disturbing piece of, of video. And for the police, they say that no officer should ever come under assault like that. Seven people have been arrested so far, and the police are looking for five additional individuals that were believed to have been involved. This all happened on Saturday when the police had approached uh, what they said was a disorderly crowd outside a migrant shelter in Times Square. And then as they moved in to take someone into custody for doing something, what, what that something is wasn't exactly clear, that's when uh, this scuffle broke out that, that you can see things got violent. The officers uh, were down on the ground with one of the suspects. Others were, were kicking and punching them. Uh, and for police, they say this is completely unacceptable. Uh, most of those involved are believed to be asylum seekers. So it raised additional questions in a city that's already been struggling with an influx of some 200,000 migrants sent to New York from the southern border. Yeah, they aren't getting asylum. That's probably I was going to say, clearly, this is a much bigger story. Just yeah. It's not just an attack on these officers, but it's our overall problem of what's happening at the border and immigration and how it's impacting New York City. And Overwhelming resources, right. law enforcement, no question. We'll and stay on fact, top of it. Yes, Aaron, please. No, the governor was asked, uh, Kira, whether, you know, these are kinds of the kinds of people that should be deported by the United States. And the governor said that's worth looking into. So it really has sparked a debate. Uh, it has also triggered a debate about uh, crime and, and, and bail because most of the suspects that have been charged and arrested were released without bail. And the police department is certainly unhappy about that. Our first reaction is why is there even a debate here? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the prosecutors are taking a look at not only this video, but they've obtained other video 
of mm. the assault and they want to be sure that mm. they understand each person's role because yep. there, there might be a degree of difference. Sure. Uh, there are also questions about identities, ages. They want to make sure they have all of that right before pressing forward with, uh, with, with charges that may warrant uh, uh, a, a no bail or some kind of you know, remanded circumstance. Of course. Got it. Appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you. Well, drivers in Washington state are on edge after a series of freeway shootings there in recent weeks. Authorities are now confirming that seven freeway shootings in just the first month of this year uh, have occurred. The search is on now for at least two suspects. And in the latest incident, that happened just yesterday. ABC News correspondent Alex Stone joins us now. Alex, is, is, this is just a, a nightmare. What's the latest? Hey there, Terry. Yeah, the, the latest on this one, yesterday afternoon, a, a driver and a passenger, they were in an Acura. They were driving down a, a road in King County in the Seattle area. Somebody in a Dodge Charger, the, the passenger in that car pulled up, started firing at them three times. The, they called 911, the, the victims did. A police helicopter went up above it. They were able to, to track the, the vehicle. They uh, tracked it all the way into an apartment complex. The people inside got out. They changed their clothes. They changed their vehicle. They left the gun, and then they were out of there, and they don't know where they went. Now, here is the thing. There have been seven of these in January, but they don't believe they were connected, any of these seven, that, that what has been going on mysteriously, uh, they, they think, has been individual incidents, individual shootings. The suspect descriptions have been different every time. The vehicle descriptions have been different every time. Nobody has been injured in any of these, incredibly, after uh, seven shootings on freeways around Seattle. But what's prompting it? Police say they don't know. They think they're not connected. This latest one being yesterday. And again, luckily, nobody injured. My goodness. Unfortunately, and it's something we're dealing here in our nation's capital. A lot of these kids on, on social media get involved with these competitions, a lot of them involving crimes like carjackings, et cetera. I talked to some police detectives about a month ago about this. It's happening here in our area. I wonder if this is some sort of challenge that they're seeing on social media. Unfortunately, it's, it's something that is, uh, that's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, Alex, let us know as you learn more. Clearly, we want to know more about it. You got it. Thanks. Well, coming up, Walmart is announcing a major expansion, how it could affect a Walmart near you when we return. The ideal male physique is tall, dark, and handsome. Money can buy you a lot of things. Money can't make you taller, right? We're bringing you behind the scenes of the newest cosmetic surgery. I feel as a man, it's like, man, I wish I was taller. We see men who are taller as the alpha. I went from 5'9". Right now, with shoes, I'm 6'1". Everybody's freaked out by it on the basis of what it's called, leg lengthening. You only live once, so go for it. The Big Business of Getting Tall, now streaming on Hulu. Friday, a stalker hunting women. It makes me shudder. A young mother vanishes. A series of apparently unconnected crimes. Another mother gunned down. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do with this? And then... A silver minivan pulls up. Oh, and he reached for the gun and I jumped out of the car. I'm the one that got away. The murderer in the minivan. I get goosebumps to think what they found. All new 2020, Friday night on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. 
I'm Rob Marciano reporting from Steamboat, Colorado, where the avalanche danger remains high because of this. It continues to snow here. You're streaming ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Walmart is announcing a major expansion, opening new stores and investing in its workforce, you they know, say. It's been years since Walmart has actually opened a new store, and they're focusing on online sales, but now they decide to make this multi-billion dollar investment in new locations across the country. We want to take you now to Pontiac, Michigan, and the courthouse there, where the prosecution is set to begin its cross-examination of Jennifer Crumbly. She's the Michigan mother okay. who is facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter after her son, Ethan, shot and killed four students at his high school in Oxford, Michigan, in 2021. Let's listen in. The jury's heard a lot about that meeting, okay? So I'm going to fast forward. You go back to work, right? Yeah. We saw the exhibit of you walking back in. Correct. Okay. We heard um, Amanda Holland testify about how she gives you some advice. Do you recall her giving you advice? I don't. Is she somebody you go to for advice? No. Why not? Um, we were never like friends outside of work, and she was Andy's administrative assistant, so it was just formalities really with her. We didn't really have anything in common. Her child was real young, not a teenager. Okay. Um, all right, I want to go to the time where you heard there was an open shooter. The jury's already heard how you heard about that, okay? And I, we know you got in your car and you drove up to Oxford, right? Correct. Okay. Um, we heard about the description of that caravan. Did you see that caravan? Um, yeah, I actually, I joined it, so a black SUV, and that was my fastest way to get to school. Okay, so you actually were a part of that um, with all the law enforcement officers all headed up. <clears throat> yep, I just kind of jumped in. What is that, Lapeer Road? Um, it started on 75. I, my, I work at Square Lake and Telegraph, so I got um, 75 from Square Lake there. And it was well before um, the 20, M24 exit. I would say about a quarter of a mile. It was, track was backed up. Okay. Now, um, you sent you sent a text, and if you need to see it, let me know. You sent a text to your son that says, you can talk to us. Why did you send him that? Um, after I left the meeting, I knew that he was sad about things, and I just wanted to let him know that he can talk to us about anything. Um, just wanted to make sure I, I opened that door. Um, you know, just let him know that we're there for him, and we love him. Okay, and... He said he loved you. Do you recall that? I do. Okay. Was that? Was there anything unusual about that? Yeah. Um, he's at that age where it was hard to get I love yous back out of him. Um, for me to open my text and just see him randomly saying I love you was abnormal for him. Right. Did you think anything at that point? Um, no, not, not right at that point. I... I I think I said text back, I love you too, I don't remember. I believe I did, yeah. Okay, and later in the thread, you say, um, don't do it. So when you hear there's an open shooter at the school, I wanna know in your mind, what do you believe is happening? Well, my, my husband had called me when I was still at work and he said there's, there's an active shooter at Oxford High School and I can't get a hold of Ethan. And that's when I opened my phone and I saw the I love you text. And then I texted him, are you okay? Um, in the process of it, I was getting my stuff and running out the door, letting my boss know that I had to go to my son's school. Um, it was on 75 when I was trying to get to, get to the exit um, that my husband called me and he asked me where I hid the bullets and I told him. And then he said the, the gun was missing. Um, so instantly, it just, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's, he's got the gun. I didn't actually think he was at the school shooting it. I thought maybe he walked home and got the gun and was in the field by the school shoot. I just, I didn't imagine my son actually going into a school and shooting. And then when we got more updates, I was like, oh my gosh, he's, he's a school shooter. He's going to kill himself because in my mind, that's what school shooters have done. They've killed themselves after. So. I yelled in my talk to text, Ethan, don't do it, because I thought he was going to kill himself. 
At that point, did you think Ethan had killed anyone? No, I didn't even think he shot anyone at that point. Well, that was going to be my next question. Did you believe he injured anyone or shot anyone, did anything? No. No, no. I thought he was going to kill himself. Okay. Um, so, you you find out the gun's missing, so you do think he's got the gun, but it's going to turn it on himself. Right. Okay. So... Where did you, at that point you went to the substation, I think we saw the video. Yeah, um, my husband had called me when I got close to the house and he said the, hub, the substation just called and they want us to come down there, they, they have my son. And so I picked him up on the way and we drove to the substation together. When you say picked him up, picked who up? They, uh, the, the, um, the, my son was in custody, basically, the, the substation. Right, so who did you pick? I picked up my husband, I'm sorry. Okay, you picked up James. Okay. What was going through your mind at this point, going from picking James up to the substation? Um, I don't know. I, I was just, I asked my husband, I was like, is he alive? And he, he said, I don't know, we're going down there. I didn't really know what to think. Um, I was kind of in a, it was kind of hazy. It was kind of, everything was a little surreal. I just, I still didn't believe that he actually shot anybody or was in the school. I just knew that. He, there was gunfire. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know the extent of it at all. So when you're at the substation, did you, you asked them about fatalities? We saw it on there. That wasn't at the sub. Oh yeah, I did. Okay, but if the, you didn't give the answer, right? No, no, at not there. At that point, were you thinking that anyone was injured or that anyone was hurt? Um, he did say there was injuries, and um, at that point, my mind went to. We can handle in injuries. We can we can handle injuries. I went into I went into kind of like go mode. Like what do we have to do. My son's arrested. Didn't think there's. I did not think there would be any fatalities. Um, you didn't think there'd be any injuries. No, I didn't think there'd be injuries. I, I didn't think there'd be anything. But I just went into that mode. Like we can handle. We can handle injuries, and we can figure this out and go from there. Okay. You saw the interview at the substation. Yes. I'm not going to go through all that with you, okay? After that, you go to your house. Is that correct? Correct. And I, the next thing, police are at your door. Um, we were at the house for a minute. And we were putting some hot water on the oven, on the stove. Um, my husband walked around, walked out back to the side of the house. I saw him walk towards the end of the driveway through my kitchen window. I was sitting in my kitchen on my phone talking to my dad, and I realized my husband was gone for a little bit longer. I didn't see him walk back, so I walked out the front door of my house. What did you see? Um, there was a bunch of officers with guns drawn on me. Have you ever been in that position before? No, I have not. What did you think when that happened? Um, I don't know. I remember just dropping my phone and putting my hands up and then being handcuffed. It, was, it all happened so fast. It was, it was shocking. Okay. We saw... You sit in the car with James with the handcuffs, right? Correct. So we don't need to go through all that. No. Nope. After that, we saw a video where you're sitting in the car and you talk to police for a long time. There's a lot of long pauses in it, right? Right. Okay. I'm not going to go through that whole video right now, okay? But if there's something you need, you can let me know. Um, during the substation meeting, while you're with um, Joe Bryan, you... Judge, again, this is direct examination. I'm, well, I'm, one way or I'm asking what a question. I'm just putting us in a space. I'm going to ask a non-leading question. Okay. Okay. So we, we see, we all can see that you are using your phone while you are speaking to law enforcement. I want to know what you're doing on your phone. Um, it's not leading. What were you doing? And the whole jury phone? can hear you constantly saying, what were, oh, Okay, so what were you doing, doing on your phone? Um, I was looking, well, first I was looking for the paper to show the officer that was sitting next to me. Um, the first one I pulled up, I couldn't get it to zoom in, so I had to search through my emails for the other one to get that pulled up. Once I got my phone back, I'm pretty sure I was going through the mass amount of text messages and Facebook messages I was receiving from family and friends asking if my son was okay. Because at this point in time, nobody knew anything. 
I was also messaging with my with my co or my boss, who happens to be an attorney, um, trying to get his advice on what to do. Um, I I was on my phone. I'm not going to deny it. I was probably looking at text messages and Facebook messages and just trying to get updates on anything. Um, Is that the same or different when you're in the back of the patrol car? What do you mean? There's a point where you're in the patrol car by yourself. Right. Okay, you've got your phone. Tell us what you're doing on your phone at that point. Um, I know I was messaging with my dad a lot because I had dropped the phone when I was talking to him and I got arrested. So I was filling him in what was going on. Um, I was also messaging immediate family members and close friends that my son was okay, but he was he was the shooter. Um, so that, that's mainly what I was doing. What was your state of mind like at that time? Um, I don't know. It was pretty. It was pretty numb. I just I didn't really believe. I had a hard time. I don't know. I I was numb. I didn't really believe like everything was happening the way it was. It was surreal. I my mind was in all different places. <laughs> Okay, so um, you, oh, you, um, when did you find out there were fatalities? Um, in the back of the car when I was by myself, and I asked the officer, um, and he told me there was, there was four fatalities. That's on the video? Yes. Um, I'm not going to ask you questions about that, okay? All we can hear is object, object, and it's it's very distracting. I would ask them to write notes or something because it's very distracting. Okay, I can hear them, but just try to get their voices down. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say object. I have, I'm, okay. I'm, okay. We're not, um, we're not saying object. Okay, well, I'm sure we can hear you saying something apparently. So. Okay. So, this is the time where you find out there's fatalities. Um, I'm going to move on to a different topic. On your cell phone, do you have a habit of deleting messages? Usually it's threads. Okay, explain to the jury what you do, because I... Um, Go ahead and explain. I, I, well, on Facebook, I do a lot of Facebook Marketplace, so I get a lot of messages. What's Facebook Marketplace? Where you buy, where you buy and sell things. Um, so my main, the first main screen of my phone will get clogged up with marketplace messages. So I'll just delete thread, threads. So my main people come up that I talk to on a regular basis. If that starts getting full, I delete those threads too. Same thing with text messages. I delete threads until the main people I talk to are up on the main screen, so I don't have to slip, have to scroll down to find them. Okay, so that's is that a habit that you started that day, that month? When did you start doing this deleting text thing? Pretty much when I got a cell phone. I've, I've always done that. Okay. Did you go out of your way, um, in this case, to delete like certain messages? Not intentionally, no. <laughs> and so when there's a message they say you deleted that indicates the gun was locked, did you do you recall deleting that message? No, I completely forgot I sent that message. Or unsending it, I'm sorry. No, I don't remember. Okay, there's, there's another message that um, is unsent talking about we did everything right, that kind of thing. Do you recall unsending that message? No. Okay. So when, we, when law enforcement got um, found that there was a lot of deleted content, does that surprise you in any way? No. Um, and you don't dispute, you've seen a lot of text message threads that have been admitted. You agree those were all the, those were a lot of the messages going on, is that right? Right. And a lot of those are what were deleted. Correct. Okay. So after your interview, um, there was a point where the, the police tell you and James, you guys need to leave the house, is that right? Yes. Where did you guys go? Um, we went up to, we it went, uh, the first time, we ended up going to the Holiday Inn Express and sitting in the parking lot trying to figure out what was going on, waiting for them to call us. Was there a point you had to go back to the house? Yes, they called us to come back to the house. Did you know why you are going back? Um, they told us that the search was over and they just wanted us to come back to the house. 
Okay, so when you got back to the house, what happened? Um, we went into the house, and then the um, detective asked for our cell phones. And were you reluctant about giving over your cell phone? Yes, I was. Okay, why is that? Um, sounds bad, but my life is in my cell phone. My contacts are in my cell phone. Everything I need is in my cell phone. I don't memorize phone numbers. I have an emergency going on, and they're taking my only means of contact away from me. Okay. There was a suggestion to go get burner phones or track phones, prepaid phones. Correct. Did you do that? Yes, we did. Okay. So there was evidence you went to Walmart in Lapeer, right? Yep. And we saw the receipts. Um, there's been a lot of text messages about threats. Tell the jury about what you were receiving. Oh, we were we were receiving so many threats on top. Oh, let me back up on our new track phones. In my Facebook Messenger, there was a ton of threats. I wasn't getting text threats on my new track phone because I had my number, but my Facebook men Messenger was blowing up with threats. Uh, once I got into my email account, that was blowing up with threats. Um, people found my realtor.com profile that I hadn't had for years and were sending me messages through that. Um, I had people sending me screenshots of te text threats they found that I didn't know about. Um, How were you feeling at this point? I was feeling pretty scared. Okay, scared of what? Um, well, scared that somebody might hurt us. Okay. Um, at that point, did you ever go back home? This is the first time, right? I'm talking after you bought the trip. Oh, no, we went to the hotel and live here. Okay. So you go to the hotel and live here. Um, and then how many, how long did you, did you stay there? Just one night. Okay, so that was the night of the 30th. The 30th, okay. What did you do on the first? Um, we, we woke up. I knew I had to make arrangements. I had um, a senior dog and two cats still at the house. I didn't know what to do with. Um, my neighbor was sending me updates, letting me know um, that there was still media around my house, um, that I had, my house had multiple um, random pizza deliveries. Um, that people were calling in. Um, so I had to get dog food for our dog, and I met her at the, um, actually in the church parking lot behind Red Naps um, that afternoon to give her the food. Okay, and I believe that we heard about that and saw the GPS stuff. Did you go to any banks? Not on that day. Okay, did you go any time that week? Yes. All right, what, why were you going to banks? Um... When all this unfolded and we found out that it was my son that was a shooter, I get a lot of advice from my dad. My dad's been involved in some, some civil suits before. Um, he told me that there's probably going to be a lot of, of, of lawsuits and they're going to try to um, take your assets. And I didn't really have any assets. The bank owned my house, the bank owned my cars, and all I had was the cash in my bank. And he said they could freeze your account. So. I went and withdrew money from my account. My dad also deposited extra money in my account during that time to give to us, to help us retain a lawyer, which I withdrew as well. Okay, so you withdrew that money. Did you withdraw anything from an account that had Ethan's name on it? Uh, we transferred money from that savings account to our account. Okay, explain that account. Um, I know it says Ethan's name on it. Is anyone else listed on the account? Uh, no, it's a Simply Kids savings account through Flagstar Bank. So he opened it with $200. Um, I don't think he really had any more than $100 left after things he wanted to buy, but I transfer money from my check into that account, so we kind of use it as a savings account, too. Okay. So, it's, so um, did you leave any money in that account? Uh, if, if we did, it was very little. Okay. Um, the next, so on December 1st, we heard testimony already that your son was charged, you watched online. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. Um, we heard on the first, did you guys stay at the hotel in Lapeer or did you go somewhere else? No, we went to um, the extended stay in Auburn Hills. Okay. Why is that? Um, probably for the cheapest rates and it was a decent hotel. Not any other reason why. Okay. So how long did you end up staying at the extended stay in Auburn Hills? Um, we ended up staying there for two days. Okay. And then... Um, have, we've heard testimony that um, charges were going to be announced at some point. 
Did you know when charges would be announced? No. Um, I was kind of following the news articles, trying to get updates. Um, my cousin was sending me a lot of texts, you know, saying, I think they're going to charge you, too. We didn't think I would get charged, me and my husband, because the gun was in his name. Um, so we had an awareness of it, but I don't think it really actually set in that it was going to happen until it did. Okay. So um, we heard testimony that um, on December 3rd, you end up at an art studio. Explain to us how you, what was the hotel? Extended stay in Auburn Hills? Correct. Okay. Tell us all where you went. Um, how did you get from that hotel to to the art studio in Detroit and why? Give us the rundown. Um, so we ended up going to Owasso to get regular cell, our normal cell phones. We couldn't, we couldn't shut down accounts. Um, why couldn't you shut down accounts? Because of two, the two-factor authentication. So I was sending a text message to my old phone number that I didn't have. So I had, in my head, my uh, employer yelling at me to shut down my LinkedIn account, um, my Instagram account, because I had my employer's name all over it. Um, so we had to get uh, cell, our cell phones with our old numbers on it to get that back. Um, Were we you ended, trying to deactivate Facebook and stuff, too? Um, I was trying, well, I already deactivated fa Facebook. My husband needed to de deactivate his Facebook. I had to deactivate LinkedIn and Instagram, and I couldn't get into my email on my burner phone because of that two-factor authentication code thing. <laughs> Okay, so you guys went to Owasso and yes. got what? We got regular cell phones with our old numbers on it. Okay. Um, then what? Um, then it's when Andre, uh, my friend, called. Is there any reason you went to Owasso we, to get those phones? Yeah, we didn't feel safe in the local area. Okay, so you drove like the hour they tested it? Okay. Yeah. All right, so then what? Um, so my friend Andre, uh, who owns the art studio, called and was checking in to see how, re how we were doing, and he wanted to stop by our hotel. It was the night of the second. Um, so he actually came to our hotel that night, and he invited us to come to his art studio the next day just to be around a friend, just to, he wanted to buy us sandwiches, he wanted to show us art studio. He's just a really nice guy that was just offering a friendship during that time when we didn't know what was going on. So that's how we ended up going to the art studio. Okay, how did you get to the art studio? Um, I drove. Okay, drove what? We drove, I, I drove my car. And my husband left um, our other car at the hotel. Okay, so we've heard about how one car is like left at this hotel. That's because you guys went together? Together. To Correct. Detroit. Correct. Okay. Did you know you were going to get charged at that point? We had heard they might announce charges um, sometime that day. Okay, but I want to know, did you know you were definitely being charged at that point? Oh, no. Okay, so you... Tell us what happened when you got to the art studio. And um, we saw the, him show you where to park. Is that what happened? Yeah. Why did you park where you parked? Um, I was parking close to the dumpster, and he told me to move away from the dumpster because people like to throw stuff out there. So I moved. he showed me where to park. So I wasn't taking anybody's parking space or blocking the dumpster or any of that. Okay. So then uh, what did you guys do that day? Um, he showed us around the, the building, um, and then we went to the art studio. Andre had a business meeting, um, I think at 11 o'clock that day. And so he left the building for a little bit. Um, he came back after charges were announced. So he came back um, when we found out we were getting charged. He brought sandwiches back. Um, at that point in time... How were you feeling at that point when you found out you are getting charged? I was freaked out. I don't... I've never been charged anything in my life. Okay. So... <clears throat> You've never been charged with a crime like this? Like this, correct. Okay. Of this magnitude? Correct. All right. So what... Okay, so you know you're charged, or you know that they want you. Um, what was your plan at that point? Um, well, I was in touch with my attorney. Um, Me. You. And I was... <clears throat> Taking your advice that we're going to turn ourselves in. Um, when were you planning to turn yourself in? Uh, the next day, so it would be Saturday morning. Okay, why was that? Um, that's when the, the Novi Court was doing um, arraignments that day. Okay, so on Friday, the whole afternoon, you know you're being charged. That afternoon, um, what was your plan at that point? Or what were you doing at that point? Um, well, we were, 
I was debating whether or not to go back to Auburn Hills and stay at the extended stay. And I think this is before we, we even knew there was a manhunt out for us. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the uh, witness with defense exhibit A? The prosecution has received it. No objection. Do you object to the submission? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, A is admitted. Um, can you tell the jury what that document shows? Um, it's a Priceline.com travel itinerary year trip from December 1st. Okay. Last visited 12-3-2021. Okay. So when you're, okay, on 12-3, are there also searches for another hotel? Uh, I think so. Yeah, that, well, there's a um, Priceline checkout, Auburn Hills, 12-4, 12-5. So I think I was looking at for those dates. So you were planning to, is it fair to say that you're looking for a hotel? Objection to leading. All right, so that exhibit, what does that tell you about <coughs> your plans for 4-4 four, four to 4-5? Four, um, to be in Auburn Hills, extend this day. Okay. What is Priceline? It's an... Um, an app where you can get last-minute hotel deals. Do you agree these are your searches? Yeah, I'm always on Priceline. Okay. Um, ultimately, on the night of the 3rd, um, are you aware, were you aware on Friday afternoon if you could go into court that afternoon? What was your awareness? <coughs> I was not aware that we could go into court that afternoon. Um, I was just waiting on direction from you to what we're going to do the following day and turning ourselves in. All right. So the prosecution showed um, lots of pictures of the art studio. We agree. That's what it looks like, right? All right. Okay. Did you guys sleep on that mattress that night? Yeah, we did. It was actually in the, um, in the hallway a common hallway the business shared and we pulled it into the art studio and slept on it that night. Okay. Did you, the prosecution showed receipts and supplies that were bought, things like that. Who went to the store and did that? Uh, my friend um, went to the store. We gave him a list and he picked up things for us. Okay. Why didn't you go to the police department? This is so distracting. I'm having a really hard time. I can move maybe and ask. Okay. Try, try not to talk. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're. Who bought those supplies? Um, my friend did. Okay. Why didn't you and James just go on your own to the police department um, and turn yourselves in? Because we didn't feel it'd be safe. Okay. Why is that? Um, just the fact that the entire community and. Michigan knew that we were expected to turn ourselves in at the police department so they would know where to go. Okay. Um, and so that night, what did you and James sleep there? We did. What time did you go to bed? What happened? Just um, really quickly. I want to say it's, it was after 11, maybe around 11 o'clock, when we finally went to bed. Um, we, we both, I'm prescribed Xanax for anxiety, and we each took four because we knew we were going to be turning ourselves in the next day, and we hadn't slept in four days, and we just wanted to sleep. Okay, so you each took four. We did. Okay, and so the next thing, um, the next piece of evidence we showed, we saw, was um, them coming in to that art studio. Do you recall that? I recall my husband screaming and there's people with guns again in our face, officers. What were you doing prior to hearing your husband scream? We were sleeping. Okay. Were you aware there was anything going on? No, I was not. Okay. We saw the video, so we don't need to go through all of that. Um, and <laughs> the prosecution admitted... I'm going to put it up on the screen. People's Exhibit 150, and I just want to verify with you. I'm sorry, can you turn it on?
Okay. Do you see it on your screen? I do. Okay. What is that? Um, that's an alarm we set for, or I set for the next morning. For Saturday morning. For Saturday morning, correct. Okay. Do you recall why you set it for six thirty, six forty? Is there two alarms or one? Yeah, there's two. Okay. Why did you set those alarms? Um, because we were going to wake up and drive to the Novi Courthouse and meet you you there by eight thirty. Okay. And what was your plan plan there? What was going to be your plan when you got to Novi? Um, we were going to be arraigned. Okay. Now, do you... There was Everything's evidence... still up. Oh, whoops. There was evidence that um, your purse and belongings were found in totes there. Did you, re you remember seeing all those pictures? I do. Okay, tell the jury why those were your purse and personal effects were in those bins. Um, I didn't know if we were going to jail. I didn't know if we were going to be bonded out. I didn't know what was going to happen, so I had told my friend where I left my purse and my backpack, where I did have all, pretty much all my money in it to grab those the next the next day or when he's at the studio. He's not usually there on the weekend, so I put him in the totes just, just for extra precaution. Um, in some of the messages the prosecution admitted, you say that you failed as a parent. Do you feel, are you a failure as a parent? I don't think I'm a failure as a parent, but at that time, um, I guess I didn't see, I felt bad that Ethan was sad at those things, and I guess I just, I don't know, I just felt like I failed somewhere. I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. It was just that point in time, I just, I just kind of felt like somewhere I failed. Do you believe there was anything, um, do you believe that you knew or had reason to know your son was a danger to anyone else? No. Um, as a parent, you spend your whole, your whole life trying to protect your, your child from other dangers. Um, you never, you never would think you have to protect your child from harming somebody else. That's what, that's what blew my mind. I just, that, that was the hardest thing I had to, to stomach is that my child har harmed and killed other people. Do you believe there were things you were thinking at the time, I should do this, but I'm not doing it? Do you look back and think that? No, I don't. I mean, I of course I look back after this all happened, and um, I've asked myself if I would have done anything differently, and I wouldn't have. If you could change what happened, would you? Oh, absolutely. I wish he would have killed us instead. Over the last um, 26 months, um, has this been stressful for you? It's been very stressful. Yes. Have you had a range of emotions? I've had a lot of emotions. Are you trying to... Are you... Do you believe you are the victim here? Um, I don't want to say that I'm a victim because I do not want to disrespect those families that truly are the victims on this. Um, but we did lose a lot. Okay. You've lost everything. We did. I need to instruct you, during the trial, do not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you must consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and the lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. Uh, do not go on social media, do not post, do not go on Facebook, do not do research, do not discuss the case with anyone, do not watch the news, do not read a newspaper. You guys have been really great and we appreciate it. All right, so I'll see you tomorrow at 8.30. All rise for the jury. Go right.
right now so that I can ask if there's anything. Um, you can see that okay she comes out? Yeah, she can step okay. down. You can be seated. You're, you're going to do cross tomorrow yes. morning. Um, and then do you know what you're going to do next? I don't. Um, Your Honor, my client and I have a number of witnesses on our list. Okay. And to be quite frank, I'm going to go to meet with her. Okay. Or I, I have arrangements to meet with her. Okay. Um, I have opinions about what we should do. I, I know that our opinions have not matched. Okay. And so we need to have some discussions. Okay. I, I just don't know who I'm going to be calling based on that. But the prosecution has my list. Okay. It's the same as it's been. Nothing's changed. Okay. I actually have two names I can give them that I'm, I know I'm not going to call. Okay. Judge, but shortly before trial, the people filed a, um, a notice of intent to admit something. Should the uh, defense counsel assert a privilege, that privilege being attorney-client communication, questions asked of the defendant, I believe, cause a revisiting of that ruling. Okay. Meaning that there was a, a thumbnail photograph recovered off of the defendant's phone from a time period where the police were on scene at 1111 Bellevue in uh, Detroit. The defendant has testified that she was waiting to hear for instructions from Ms. Smith. She can't testify to any communication between herself and her attorney without waiving the privilege. That privilege has been waived. We, we should be now entitled to explore what that text message was. The timing of it was is very important, especially considering the timing of the 911 call in Detroit, as well as the timing of the fugitive team's arrival in Detroit, and the timing of the arrest of the defendants. Are you talking about the text that I already saw? Yes, Judge. The two-word text. Now, when, Taking this stand in her own defense, Jennifer Crumbly, the mom of Michigan high school shooter Ethan Crumbly, testifying today as she faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter in connection with that shooting that killed four students. Her husband does have his own trial coming up soon. In today's testimony, a sometimes emotional Crumbly recounting the days and months preceding that shooting. You can see her sitting there on the left of your screen. She talked about what she knew and did not know about her son. She even went as far as saying that she wished that she and her husband had been killed by their son instead of the other victims that day. Let's bring in our legal contributor and trial attorney, Brian Buckmar, who's been following this all day. Brian, this was a highly anticipated moment in the trial. First of all, walk us through what's happening right now in the courtroom after this testimony ended and what stood out to you, Brian? So right now what's going on is the prosecution, I think it's making the right uh, objection or at least alerting the court that they expect to go into the communications between Jennifer Crumbly and her attorney. Now, typically, that's what we call attorney-client privilege. Um, I, myself, representing people uh, in yeah. the city of New York for over nine years, even after I've represented them, I can't tell you what my client told me. Uh, but if a client tells another person or especially tells the court, they are in essence waiving that privilege and now someone can question them and they must answer that. So when Jennifer Crumbly goes up there and says, well, I was speaking to my attorney and she was gonna give me the, uh, the kind of the signal to turn myself in, that's in essence waiving that privilege and the prosecution is making the right argument that they should be able to dive into that conversation that they typically can't to explore the timing of when she's supposed to turn herself in. Uh, in terms of what stuck out to me, um, a lot of this testimony, in my mind, is good for her. Uh, really trying to create empathy for the jurors to say, I'm just like you, I'm just a regular parent. I missed some of these steps. I wish I had seen them. But I'm expecting that this cross-examination be very damaging in terms of juxtaposing what she said with whatever evidence they have to show that she's either misleading or wrong in some way. Brian, we did hear Jennifer Crumbly get emotional as she was describing those moments before the police came to get her. She said, in retrospect, though, she wouldn't have done anything differently. She said she doesn't think she's failed as a parent, but that there are some places that she failed. How do you think the jury will hear her arguments and this argument from her that she didn't do anything wrong, that she wouldn't have done anything differently? I mean, I understand it. I've represented uh, clients where their parents say the exact same thing. They, they don't believe anything wrong. But when your son 
uh, pled guilty to a mass shooting, there is a misstep there. There is an error there. There is something where you say, I failed in some regard. And when you have a jury of 10 women and seven men, many of them parents themselves, I think they're all looking at Jennifer Crumbly and say, you know what? You've got to take some onus here. I often use the phrase in, in the situations like this, you can say, hey, my hands aren't bloody, but they are dirty. I've made some mistakes, and I would have expected her to take some remorse. And to the emotional aspect, I saw the emotion as it applied to her. Sadness for her, sadness for her situation, sadness for her son. I didn't see much emotion or sadness directed to the victims in this case, and I think that's going to hurt her in some regard. She, Brian, she said she didn't feel safe turning herself into the police department. Is that something that carries weight when you think about how there was this search for her and her husband? Will the jurors buy that argument that she didn't feel like she could go turn herself in because it wasn't safe? I, I mean, my question, and I think the prosecutor's gonna ask the same question, safe from what? What, what? what what fear did you have? Did you think that you would turn yourself into law enforcement and they would kind of let you loose to the mob to, for them to make good on the threats that she received or that she said she received. Uh, I think an explanation going further than I just didn't feel safe is something that's going to need to be explained here. And that explanation may be something that either clears up that, that, that reasoning or is more damaging than what she initially thought. What are you hoping to hear now, Brian, when the prosecution begins cross-examination? So in a case like this, one of the major difficulties of putting your client on the stand, and I call them the, the what about questions. Uh, in a case where the prosecution is saying you missed red flags, I think what's gonna happen is they're gonna take concrete evidence that cannot be disproven, put it in front of her and say, well, what about this? Why wasn't this a red flag for you? What about that? Why wasn't that a red flag for you? You said this on direct examination. Well, we have evidence that you should have thought about this way. And I think that comment of, I don't think I failed as a parent uh, comes up, hey, I've only been a parent for 18 months. I'm in no position to, to criticize another parent, uh, especially a mother. But I think the jurors in this case are going to say no. In many regards, this is a failure, and we will hold you accountable. Uh, I, I'm looking to that cross-examination and then the redirect to see if her attorney can rehabilitate any of her answers going forward. A lot more to watch. Brian Buckmeyer, thank you so much, as always, for being here with us. I'm Elizabeth Schulze, and thank you for streaming with us. More news is ahead. Tonight. Can't use your shield as a sword. That's a, that's a problem. I, Your Honor, I'm suggesting that if if my client opened the door to that in any way, that you instruct the jury they're not to consider it and strike that testimony. I, we did not intend to open that door. I don't even remember, and I don't even know what that text message is. I saw that. I obviously responded to their filings. I have no memory of that text or this timing. So, okay, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I'm just saying that I would just say that this this should all, this should just be instructed to be inadmissible and tell the jury to absolutely ignore any testimony about any communications with the attorney. The, the waiver, the defendant signed the waiver. Defense counsel signed the waiver. It's, again, sword and shield, Judge. This is exactly what counsel is doing. And we can have someone from computer crimes extract any com any conversations communications between the defendant and her attorney